Hello guys, welcome back to my channel The Fanfic Fantasy. Join us as we explore the world of fanfiction and fantasy and bring you the best story and discussions. This is the fifth part of What if Tanjiro time traveled and became a demon? So give this video a like and subscribe for more videos in future. So let's get into the fanfic. Trigger warning for violence. Kokushibo had haunted the area of Dauma's fight with Kamado since the night Musen had called his Kazuki to explain the situation. Unfortunately, he'd had no luck. Almost a month of wandering the different roads and the most he'd found was an area where the wisteria trees were in full bloom still. Odd, but of little consequence. As waxing moon won, the trees had little effect on him. He avoided them because they weren't comfortable to be around. But he'd also searched the area inside the ring of trees and had found a decent-sized population of weak demons. But nothing else of note, really. There had been a set of stone stairs leading up the side of the mountain to a ceremonial door, and it was obviously at least somewhat maintained. But no one was there now. He'd still checked the area fairly regularly since. He had little doubt it had something to do with the demon slayers. That was the only reason he'd heard the screams. Like someone completely and utterly torturing someone else. No, not just someone else, a demon. Furious, Kokushibo had followed the sounds, heading in the same direction even after it stopped. He'd come well past the line of wisteria trees when the shrieks silenced. As he got closer, he heard shouting and an argument. Too coherent for weak demons, so are they humans, or more powerful demons. And then he saw the pair of arguing people. A tall, white-haired man in a demon slayer's uniform, likely in his early twenties, was certainly easier to spot in the darkness. But Kokushibo's eyes immediately went to the smaller form and his heart leapt in anticipation. He'd found his target. First form, Dark Moon, Evening Palace, he whispered, only barely able to conceal his excitement. To his amusement, both of the figures dodged, rolling out of the way and coming back to their feet facing where Kokushibo landed, in the clearing near the dead body of a human, curious but ultimately unimportant in the light of this fight. He could sense Musen's approval in the back of his head at this stroke of luck. He could see the fear in the boy's wide eyes. He knew what he was up against. Kokushibo. The child whispered, so he did no details about him. The demon wondered exactly how, and he would get his answers before he killed the boy. But for now, I see I've finally caught up with you, the demon said. Kamado Tenjiro. The boy, Kamado, glanced over at the other demon slayer for a moment. A pillar, Kokushibo concluded from his fighting spirit. He wondered how good said pillar would be. The man had taken a defensive stance against both the new arrival and his companion, though. Animosity, distrust, hum, that might make this fight too easy. Not that he would shirk his duty to either kill or capture the brat, but it had been so long since he'd been able to test and prove himself against a worthy opponent. Kamado looked pained for several seconds before his expression hardened into steel, and he took a deep breath. Then his power flared, and when he opened his eyes again, they had gone from dark to a bright red bordering on neon. They also had the kanji waxing zero written in them. Inwardly Kokushibo smiled until he realized the fear hadn't left the boy's expression. So he frowned. That is not the face of a waxing moon. It had the desired effect of bringing out Kamado's determination even more, even if he did not answer as expected. Good. The swordsman tilted his head to one side, studying the boy. He did not lose track of the pillar either. He was no amateur. He wasn't impressed with what he found but he'd long since realized that one should never judge by appearance. Time for his test. Let me see if you earn that placement, Kokushibo said, taking his stance. Shin is san the boy said, voice calm. He didn't take his eyes off of his opponent. Getting in the middle of this will kill you. Please don't interfere. Oh, so they had come to this mountain together. A pillar and a waxing moon in the same area without trying to kill each other. Musen would not like that. Kokushibo couldn't say he felt particularly strongly about it, though. They were all weaklings in his opinion. The white-haired man looked both shocked and offended. He opened his mouth to say something, but before he could, as if someone had shouted the beginning of a match, he and Kamado both attacked each other. Their swords clashed and an unexpected nostalgia hit Kokushibo. This style truly was the sun style his brother had invented. The style that had overcome him. The style he would overcome. The boy was, by no means, a master at the style. Competent, yes, above average, even. But he was no match for a sword master of over 400 years whose blood art complemented his style so well. The boy had his own fire-based blood art, and from what he'd seen, it was no weak blood art, but this wouldn't be a contest. It wouldn't be nearly as satisfying as Kokushibo had hoped. 
he wouldn't be able to claim back his superiority. Demon blood art. The boy hissed as he dodged yet another barrage of blades. Palm fire explosion. Kokushibo jumped back, away from the fire, but used his breathing form to send blades through the flames. He wasn't sure if that fire just burned demonic energy or only that which was physically demonic. He almost allowed himself a grin when the blades shot through the flames with little to no resistance. The kid managed to dodge, and then he pushed his blood art farther. Kokushibo jumped over it. Kamado extended the area of the fire even more and the waxing first realized he wouldn't be able to land where he'd been aiming without consequence. Part of him was curious to see if he could power through it or overcome it somehow, but nowhere near enough of him for him to sabotage the fight. He would avoid the fire for as long as he could. He wasn't a fighter who took unnecessary risks. Ninth form, he began waning moon swats. He swung his sword down, created a stream of long-range slashes, the force of which shot him back into the air and took him well beyond the range of the fire, much to the boy's frustration. You aren't as good as he was, the demon said as he landed, wondering if that would even mean anything to the boy. Apparently it did, because he answered angrily. I never claimed to be. Kokushibo raised an eyebrow and tipped his head to one side again. If you are rank zero, you would have to beat me. Did you not think of that when you came up with your farce? He wasn't quite sure what to expect from the boy at that. But a blank expression full of confusion wasn't it. Wait, what? The boy asked. Kokushibo would give him full marks for acting, but this was the only thing that really made sense. You are, indeed, strong, he acknowledged, but going against Musen-sama to a point where you would copy his marks was foolish at best. The boy looked utterly dumbfounded at that. Waxing one would not let it sway him. You will pay for your insolence, he stated firmly. And with that, he shot forward. The boy's eyes widened and he could barely move to counter, but counter he did. Parhelion Rainbow, he yelled, leaving several images in his wake. That will not work on me, Kokushibo yelled. I trained with the original Sun Breather. The boy grit his teeth and pushed harder, turning to attack. Kokushibo hadn't even gone full out yet. But if the child could push himself even more, then maybe he'd finally fulfill his ambition. Kamado still managed to duck the moon breather's strikes. And then he changed. The mark on his face grew and began to wave as if they were actual flames. Just like Yoriichi, it incensed Kokushibo. He willed his blade to grow and branch out. Three separate blades sprouting from the main one. The boy didn't look phased. Just like Yoriichi. Actually, he had that particular look to his eyes. Could he access the transparent world? Perhaps this child was more impressive than he'd thought before. Not that it would matter. They clashed swords again, and again, and every time Kokushibo upped his speed, the boy would somehow find a way to match it. Eventually, they broke off and slid back, away from each other. Shin as Yugawa san go. Get back to Waikata sama The boy suddenly yelled. Kokushibo turned some attention onto the demon slayer in time to hear a plethora of colorful language come out of the savage's mouth. It was a vile way of saying, no. For that alone, he knew the man would die. Well, that and the fact that this was a pillar. Kokushibo couldn't let such a high-ranked person get away. A demon working for the demon slayer's core. He couldn't help but ask the boy curiously. Exactly how did you manage that? The boy just bared his teeth and kept his stance. Regardless, they'll never accept you, boy. They will never respect someone who has eaten a human before. A flicker of pain passed over the boy's face before he schooled his expression. Kokushibo decided to press his advantage. I wonder, who did you eat? Other demon slayers? Friends? Family? The boy certainly tensed up at that last one. Family, then. Not that family mattered in the long run. Not like Kokushibo had been raised to believe. Not like the entire country seemed to believe. It isn't uncommon for newly turned demons. Although your turning seems to have been unconventional. Kokushibo cut off when the boy practically disappeared and then reappeared in front of him, aiming for his neck. He brought his blade up just in time, but quickly found himself on the defense. The boy's movements had become smoother and yet more raw at the same time, fueled by his anger. Is that why you hate Musen-sama enough to risk getting into the Demon Slayer core? He asked, more delighted than he probably should be. This, this was a worthy fight. Did you care for your family that much? The boy didn't answer immediately, but his strokes gained even more intensity and Kokushibo could almost see the child's breaths coming out of his mouth despite the warm night air. My family is everything to me. He finally hissed. Kokushibo allowed himself the indulgence and indignity of a snort. Then you simply killed them before they could turn on you, he said. You can never trust anyone but yourself. You know nothing about them. Kamado screamed and Kokushibo saw the slice coming towards his neck. While it had the speed, it didn't have the grace or control necessary to actually reach the waxing first. I don't need to, the older demon replied. 
It is simply the way of things. Instead of incensing the boy further, he backed off. Kokushibo allowed him to, curious. What a sad life you lead, the child finally said. Sad and lonely and purposeless. I thought you, of all the waxing moons, would have something to fight for. And in the end, you have nothing. I pity you, more so than even Musen. Kokushibo refused to let himself be goaded by this child. It took a great deal of control. I am not the one to be pitied, he finally said, raising his blade. You are, the boy insisted, and I think you know it. You've known it since your brother died, perhaps even before that. The waxing first couldn't withhold his cry of anger as he shot forward, moon blades circling around him. He may or may not have grown a couple of extra limbs in the process. The boy's eyes widened and he brought his sword up, but not nearly fast enough. Fifth form, moon spirit calamitous eddy. The boy knew he'd been beaten and it was so, so satisfying. The storm of blades cut right through him in several areas, and the momentum shot the boy up and into the air short one arm and both legs at different lengths. The child somehow managed to hold on to his sword with his single arm left, but that was more luck than anything. Tokushibo watched as the child landed with a sickening thud and several cracks, crying out in pain. He wished now he had not been so indulgent to the brat. He should have followed his duty from the beginning. Well, he would now. He stalked forward with determination, ready to end this farce once and for all. XXX. Sami watched the battle start with wide eyes, unable to hide his shock. Because the kid hadn't moved like that before. The wind pillar was one of the strongest pillars currently in the core, and among the fastest due to his styles. Shinobu was definitely faster, though. So maybe she could follow the battle playing out before him better. Because it was not easy. He'd known the kid was strong. It had been obvious. He hadn't realized just how strong. Kamado kept up with, and even returned strikes on, the waxing first. Sami didn't realize even demons could move like this. It was, awe-inspiring and utterly horrifying at the same time. And then he realized the kid had been holding back on them. Because with moves like this, he could have taken an entire group of unsuspecting Hashira. And yet, he hadn't. Why? Because with this kind of strength, he could have wiped out the entire Slayer core. It would have taken planning and time, but would have also definitely been doable especially if he'd taken them by surprise. And Sami wasn't entirely sure it was humanly possible to prepare for these levels of power. Maybe if they'd been ready and had multiple prepared Hashira to throw at the problem. It made him feel weak, and he hated it. He suddenly realized that just one Hashira on this kid hadn't been enough. Not if Kamado had truly wanted to ditch them or kill them or sabotage them. For the first time, he seriously considered the whole situation. Had the kid actually been telling the truth the entire time? Sami swallowed, but he'd never been one to back down. Wind was aggressive. Wind was attack. Wind got diverted but never stopped. He would find ways to rise to a higher level. If this was what they had to contend with, what other choice did they have than to adapt? And adapt he would. It also bothered him that the two demons had fought with almost no regard to him. Yes, they were on another level, but he was still a Hashira, not a newly minted Mizunoto. He would have a say in this fight, he vowed. While he'd been contemplating all of that and looking for an opening he could take advantage of, they'd come to a stop, backing away from each other to refocus. Shinna's Yugawa-san, go. Get back to Wayakata sama Kamado yelled over to him. Sami saw red. The brat of a demon was telling him to run. Not in this lifetime. He didn't know what he said right after that, but he was pretty sure it wasn't nice to them or their parentage. Eh, they deserved it. His tirade faded off when he realized waxing one had all six eyes turned to him, calculating. Sami refused to let that intimidate him, at least visually. Then the long-haired demon turned to look back at Kamado, a little surprised. A demon working for the Demon Slayer's core, he asked, sounding a little incredulous. Sami couldn't help but wonder what he'd expected. They hadn't been outright fighting when he showed up, arguing, yes, but only the Wind Hashira had drawn his sword and he hadn't even been swinging it around. Didn't that give away that they were, at least temporarily, working together? Apparently not, because the waxing moon continued, directing his question at Kamado. Exactly how did you manage that? The boy just bared his teeth, holding his sword in front of him. The newcomer scoffed. Regardless, they'll never accept you, boy. They will never respect someone who has eaten a human before. Sami wasn't quite sure what to expect, but guilt and pain wasn't it. The kid wasn't denying it. The wind pillar turned his full disgust on his current partner, but the boy paid him no heed. As if sensing blood in the water, the older demon continued haughtily. I wonder, who did you eat? Other demon slayers, friends, family. Even in the dark and from the distance the wind pillar had retreated to when the demons had begun their clash, he could see Kamado tense. Sami's eyes widened and he felt sick for not having pressed his distrust of the brat. 
that wasn't forgivable, especially after his comment on Sammy's mother. Family, then, the older demon nodded as if it were a given. Sammy hadn't realized his utter disgust and loathing of demons could get any worse. He'd been very, very wrong. It isn't uncommon for newly turned demons, although your turning seems to have been unconventional. Waxing one cut off when the demon brat practically disappeared and then reappeared in front of him, sword swinging at his neck. That had been even faster than before. The older demon managed to fend the attack off, but even the most inexperienced of swordsmen could see it had been hasty and sloppy, especially compared to the graceful arcs the demon had used before. Kamado seemed more focused and determined than ever, driven by anger, maybe, but instead of wild and uncontrolled, his movements had become tighter. But with an underlying emotion to them Sanmi could only begin to guess at. Is that why you hate Musen sama enough to risk getting into the Demon Slayer core? Waxing one managed to ask, and was that a grin on his face? Was he goading the kid? Did he think he needed an advantage to win? Or, did he want Kamado to get stronger for some reason? Weird all around in Sanmi's opinion. Did you care for your family that much? Musen's demon asked. And somehow, impossibly, the kid's fighting level rose even more. Sammy could swear he saw steam coming out of the brat's mouth. And was that mark on his forehead moving? My family is everything to me. He finally returned, barely loud enough for the wind pillar to hear. Waxing one snorted. Then you simply killed them before they could turn on you. He said, you can never trust anyone but yourself. Those words brought Sammy up short. And, for the first time ever, he found himself feeling, well, almost sorry for a demon. Just a little, because living like that for centuries must have sucked. Sanmi at least had people he would give his life for, people he wanted to protect. Oyakata Sama, Jenya, even the other Hashira and humans in general. Sure, he was a lone wolf kinda guy, but he could still trust in and work with his fellow demon slayers. He glanced at Kamado. Mostly, you know nothing about them. The demon brat screamed, swinging his sword at blinding speed. Waxing one seemed to be expecting said swing because he managed to block it far more gracefully than before. I don't need to, the older demon replied. It is simply the way of things. Kamado backed away again, and seeing me expected another attack, but the boy just stood there. Strangely enough, the older demon allowed it. What a sad life you lead, Kamado finally spoke, his voice soft and full of pity. That was the first time he felt he and the brat had ever been on the same page. It was. Disconcerting. The kid went on, sad and lonely and purposeless. I thought you, of all the waxing moons, would have something to fight for. And in the end, you have nothing. I pity you, more so than even Musen. Waxing one's expression darkened and he raised his blade. I am not the one to be pitied. Kamado didn't back down, shaking his head. You are, and I think you know it. You've known it since your brother died, perhaps even before that. The brother who had been part of the Demon Slayer Corps. Sammy remembered something about how he'd invented breath styles. He couldn't think on the matter more, though, as Waxing One launched forward, screaming in rage. He swung his misshapen blade and more of the moon blades appeared, circling around him. Horns and scaly appendages of gross, pink flesh sprouted from his back. Sammy only caught a glimpse of him before he moved, but it was disgusting. Kamado backed up, eyes wide, and he raised his blade but he seemed to be on the back foot. Sammy wasn't sure what to think about that. Fifth form, Moon Spirit Calamitous Eddy. Waxing one shouted, swinging his sword down in multiple arcs and slashes. The moon-shaped blades shot forward in a literal storm of wind and crescent shapes, encircling the brat. Sammy knew what was coming. What surprised him was how he felt about it. Was that, wariness, certainly not concern. Not for a human-eating demon. The swing managed to hit. The brat flew into the air with a cry of pain, streaming towards the wind pillar. He left several of his limbs behind, although he managed to keep a hold of his sword, somehow. Sammy and the demon both watched as the boy landed. Hard, he could hear the bones crack, any human would be dead. But the boy wasn't human. It was the agony and the cry of pain the boy screamed out that made Sammy wince. That, that was too human. A war raged inside the wind pillar's mind as, for the first time, he saw Kamado beaten. This brat who could hold off four Heshira at once. And it also seemed to occur to him that this was a kid. He was also a demon who had eaten people, but he was a kid who was trying to help. Because if he wasn't, he could have easily killed his companion, Hashira or not, and left. Heck, he could have gone back to the core and made up some story. But, it all came back to the fact that Sammy could never trust a demon. Not after his kind, loving mother who had been so strong couldn't see past the demonic instincts. Kamado couldn't be older than Jenya. The waxing moon was approaching them, slow and methodical, eyes cold and almost satisfied. He would show no mercy. Not that Sanmi would expect less from a demon, but still, 
I am sure you wonder why your limbs aren't regrowing, the now very ugly demon said, voice like ice. It comes down to this, while I, a demon, can control my blade at will, it is still a Nikiron blade. Sami saw the kid struggling to sit up, face scrunched up in a wince. Come on, the boy hissed, his arms and legs seemed to be bubbling, rather disturbingly, but they would not regrow fast enough. Not at this rate, even Sami could see that. Right about then, the Wind Pillar realized that regardless of his situation, if he let Musen's demon win, he would stand no chance of surviving. If he aided the brat, though, he might. He didn't like the brat. He didn't trust the brat as far as he could throw Heimjima with just his pinky finger. But that was already leagues ahead of one of Musen's most loyal traitors. A eh, whatever. His chances for survival were already dwindling. If he wanted to make the most of that chance, he had to give the kid time to regenerate. So he ran forward and put himself between the two demons. Behind him, he heard the kid gasp, Shinazugawa-san, hurry up and regenerate, he said, then realized that he should probably show his support. As much as it pained him, it would help their chances of survival. Marginally, Sun Pillar, he didn't know what the kid's reaction to that would be. Wasn't sure he wanted to know as he kept his eyes on the approaching waxing moon. All he did know was that this demon, Kokushibo, had stopped. I was going to kill you later, he said nonchalantly. But if you insist on now, then so be it. Bring it, monster. He yelled. First form, dust whirlwind cutter. Wind form wasn't as fast as lightning form. It was nothing to spit at either. He put every ounce of energy he could into the attack, pouring on the speed. It wasn't nearly enough. Waxing one vanished from sight and seeing me expected an attack, but nothing came. He heard a cry from behind him and turned just in time to see the waxing first swing at Kamado's neck. The boy managed to deflect it with the sword in his single hand, somehow, but it only bought him time. Seconds at the most, Sami decided to make the best of it. He used another first form, pushing faster and farther than he had before. In only seconds, it felt like all he could hear was the pounding of his heart in his chest. Something on his cheek itched but he paid it no heed. He pushed even harder, straining to get there in time. He aimed for the guy's neck, but the demon turned around, anger written all over his horned face, and blocked it. But the wind cutter, like most wind forms, had several attacks and one of them managed to get through the demon's guard, slicing off his arm. It wasn't his sword arm, and it was the only hit that landed, but it meant something. The demon let out a cry of anger, and before Sami could even land and move again, waxing one slashed. Suddenly, Sami's legs wouldn't respond and the world tipped strangely. In the background, Kamado screamed. Sami couldn't make out his words though. The world had gone muted. He hit the ground before he realized what had happened. Then he saw the bottom half of his body, his legs and hips now separate from his torso, also fall beside him. He blinked as he struggled to process that in its implications. And then the pain hit. It wasn't anything he wasn't used to. He cut himself open on a regular basis during fights. But it also let him begin to process the implications. He had minutes left to live. If that, if he utilized his breathing techniques, should he? Did it matter? He did notice waxing one stumbling, eyes wide. Likely it was the unexpected Marechi blood scent. He hoped Kamado had the sense to attack now. At least some good could come of this, right? Sorry, Genya, he whispered aloud, his last thoughts of his brother and his family. His family who he'd finally see again. And Kenny, he'd missed her too. Then he heard Kamado yell, palm fire explosion. And the world lit up around him. A fitting send-off, he supposed. He closed his eyes and waited for the end. The world around Tenjiro slowed down. He stared up at the back of the single Hashira who hated him and everything he stood for more than anything else. And yet, this man had stepped between him and Kokushibo. That would be a death sentence for anyone else save maybe Musen himself and everyone there knew it. And yet, the Wind Pillar had done so willingly. Shinazugawa-san. He whispered, almost not believing it. Hurry up and regenerate, the older Hashira said over his shoulder. Then he paused before speaking again through his teeth. Sun Pillar. Tenjiro's breath caught in his throat and he swore he almost felt tears coming to his eyes. That could also be from the pain of losing and trying to regrow limbs. But he doubted it. Still, as much as he welcomed the new acknowledgement, this was not a good situation. He hadn't slept enough in recent days and he was hungry and tired and his limbs weren't regrowing as fast as normal which was still several seconds slower than most of the waxing moons. And yet, he couldn't let Shinazugawa down. Gritting his teeth, he focused on his arm and legs, demanding they grow back and redirecting all his energy to that cause. The strange bubbling that tended to happen whenever he lost limbs grew faster and farther. I was going to kill you later, he heard Kokushibo say calmly, as if commenting on the weather. But if you insist on now, then so be it. Bring it, monster, Shinazugawa yelled, then launched himself forward. 
first form, Dust Whirl and Cutter. The Wind Pillar was by no means a weak pillar. He had earned his title and Tanjiro would certainly count him as one of the stronger pillars in the core. But he was up against Kokushibo, Waxing One, and Waxing One would have little problem overcoming any obstacle between himself and Tanjiro. He dodged the many cuts sent at him by the older Hashira and suddenly stood over Tanjiro, blade ready to cut his head off. He didn't think he could survive that, and he did not want to go through all of this again. Not again. A cry escaped his throat as he raised his blade, trying to brace it with what had grown of his arm. It deflected that swing but Kokushibo went in for another blow. He wouldn't be able to block or dodge this one. Maybe he could move so it hit his torso instead. Behind the older demon, he heard Shinazugawa shriek in frustration and anger. The pillar rushed forward, and even in that moment he must have pushed himself beyond his limits, because Tanjiro could see the windmill-like mark appear on his face. The time traveler's eyebrows approached his hairline. However, Shinazugawa shouldn't have screamed. Instead of lopping off Tanjiro's head, Kokushibo turned and swung his ridiculous sword at the wind pillar. Shinazugawa had already launched his attack, though and while Kokushibo changed his attack into a block, one of the wind blades sliced right through the demon's arm. The white-haired man grinned like a maniac, but he couldn't stop himself, and Kokushibo was already swinging again, a cry of rage shooting from his parted lips. Tanjiro felt his breath stop. No, 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 no. They needed him, and he'd been with Tanjiro. Tanjiro should have protected him. No, he yelled out, long and loud, not sure of what else he could say or do. The swing connected, and kept going. The man's torso fell to the ground, followed by his legs, completely separate of each other. Above him, Kokushibo stumbled in surprise. Then the scent hit Tanjiro and it was all he could do to not attack the Marechi himself. No, his arms. He had to regrow his arms. At least it took Kokushibo several seconds to overcome the smell as well. He grit his own teeth and began grumbling about upstarts who didn't know their place as he focused on regrowing his own limb. He'd had far more practice than Tanjiro, it seemed, because it grew back almost instantly. He checked it, wiggling his fingers, as if he had all the time in the world. Meanwhile, Shinazugawa's wide eyes softened and he smiled sadly. Sorry, Jenya, he whispered. And that was just too much for Tanjiro. He could not go back and tell Jenya his brother had died, protecting him. And that was when the time traveler realized his blood literally littered the entire clearing. He had enough energy for that, at least. Palm fire explosion. He yelled, willing the entire area to light up in red and pink fire. It caught Kokushibo off guard and for the first time, Tanjiro heard him scream in pain. It wasn't a pleasant sound. Burn out the demon, he thought and pushed all but the barest of his energy and will into that single thought alone. The rest he shunted into finishing growing his limbs. Unlike the other demons Tanjiro had caught in his flames, Kokushibo swung his sword madly in an attempt to stop the burning. The younger demon had to clumsily dodge several swings before he could once again get to his feet. His bare feet but he could handle it. He was just thankful the waxing first hadn't thought to use his own blood art just yet. Tanjiro sheathed his blade and scrambled toward Sami's body just as his limbs finished growing, reaching their full size. He reached down for the dying man but paused. He could take care of Kokushibo now, or he could get Shinazugawa out of here to die peacefully. Right about then, Kokushibo began to use his demon blood art, though, and Tanjiro wasn't sure he could finish off the waxing moon yet. Who was he kidding? He'd already made his choice. Scooping both halves of Shinazugawa up, Tanjiro turned and took off, racing as fast as he could out of the forest while keeping the flames up behind him. Kokushibo wouldn't let them escape if he let down on that. Surprised, the wind pillar looked up. It was a miracle he was still alive. He must be using his breath forms to do so. Hang in there, Shinazugawa-san. He said, focusing on running away instead of the scent of the absolutely delicious smelling blood. The wind pillar just laughed as Tanjiro raced through the trees. You really are on our side, aren't you? Tanjiro didn't answer except to nod, eyes focused ahead of him. Heh, the white-haired man chuckled. Then he sighed. Say goodbye to Jenya, for me, eh? Tell him to stop being an idiot and go find a good woman to settle down with. You can tell him yourself, Tanjiro said, although it was more out of reaction than anything. They passed through the wisteria trees and into the wilderness outside of it. Tanjiro wasn't even sure which way he was running. He just wanted to get away from Kokushibo. At least he had his answer about whether he deserved the waxing zero position or not. You can't save me, kid, Shinazugawa said, words slurred. Tanjiro grit his teeth because he wanted to save him. He wasn't sure what would happen if Sami wasn't there with them at the end, not to mention the man had been killed protecting him. Wait, he froze mid-step, eyes wide. He could save Shinazugawa, but would the man want it? I can save you, he whispered. Shinazugawa must have reached his limit because he didn't respond. His breathing had slowed. 
Tanjiro panicked. Shinazugawa, I can save you. But, no response. His window for acting was closing. Tanjiro grit his teeth, realizing that this would bring very, very harsh scrutiny on him. But he couldn't just let the wind pillar die. Decision made. He took a deep breath and bit his finger. One day, I hope you can forgive me, he whispered and then plunged his hand into Shinazugawa's chest. XXX. Sammy didn't expect to wake again, but his eyes opened. To nothing but darkness. Before, he'd been slowly losing feeling. Hands and arms and even his chest and stomach growing numb. Now, his entire body felt as if it were on fire, seizing up to a point where he could barely move and he couldn't even scream it out. Every muscle tensed and he couldn't relax them if he wanted to. If this was hell, it sure lived up to its reputation. Eventually, he managed to shriek out an unholy scream of pure agony, or he would have had someone not put something over his mouth. He still tried, moving instinctively to hopefully alleviate the utter pain that took over his mind. He couldn't think of anything else. He heard something outside of him but couldn't make out who or what it was through the agony. He arched his back, scrabbled at the ground, clutching at the dirt before his hands would spasm and he'd let it go, only to tense and curl them up again. The bones were moving, changing, and he couldn't stop them. What was happening to him? He wished with all his heart that the pain would. Just stop. He would do anything. Then he felt something soft in his hand, squeezing it. It took him a moment to register, but then he squeezed back, grateful for any comfort, as small as it was. He felt a snap as whatever was holding his hand broke, but he couldn't make himself let go. It hurt, so much. He heard a hiss of pain that wasn't his, but that was all he could process before the burning overtook his senses again. And then the hunger started. He tried to gasp, but whatever was over his mouth stopped him from doing so. The world around him began to grow brighter. No, it was more like he could just see better and he finally made out his companion, the demon brat, looking down on him with such a concerned expression. Oh, right. He was dying. But should it feel this bad? His body racked in pain and his stomach feeling like it wanted to gnaw on itself. There was something to that, but he couldn't make out what. His thoughts were so blurry, like he was trying to think through a fog. He could remember everything if he tried but he didn't want to try right now. He just wanted to eat. He couldn't stop himself from lashing out and the kid backed away, jumping to gain distance as he watched. Wait, what was his name again? Sanmi. His name was Sanmi. Shinazugawa Sanmi. Shinazugawa San? The boy said cautiously, glowing red eyes fixed on him warily. He liked the cautious look in his eye, but it also felt wrong. And there was a scent. Such a good scent. It made his mouth water. It made it hard to think. We have to go before Kokushibo catches up, the boy said, still looking at Sanmi like he was a wild animal. No, he didn't like that look. He hated that look. Too many people gave him that look. He found himself snarling angrily, showing his teeth at the boy. He wanted to stay. He wanted to find the source of that scent. Oh, it was on the plants around him, on the forest floor. That sucked. He bent down to lick it. It smelled so good. Then, to his surprise, the boy snarled back and suddenly Sanmi knew this was not someone to rebel against. He didn't know how he knew, but every fiber of his body was telling him to obey. He'd already backed down before he could register it, holding his head in his hands. Why couldn't he think? Shinazugawa, the boy said in a commanding voice, You will follow me. Now, Sanmi hated it, but he nodded his head quickly. The boy bit his lip, looking pained and unsure, but then he took a deep breath and leapt into the treetops. Follow him, something whispered inside of him. That same thing he couldn't really seem to fight right now. So he did as it said. He leapt into the treetops and followed his master. Yes, that sounded right. And wrong. So wrong. But he'd figure that out later. After he'd gotten something to eat. He really hoped they could stop and hunt soon. Hunt for food. He needed food. XXX. Tenjiro hadn't known what to expect, really. He'd thought that turning Shinazugawa-san like that would have simply saved his life. He'd be the same explosive jerk he'd always been and that would be that. But he'd gotten a demon. It made Tenjiro sick to know that he'd been responsible for that. Even now, he could feel Shinazugawa's base instincts had taken over. It was all he could do to command his fellow pillar to follow him. And it wasn't helping his own hunger. At least they'd gotten away from what was left of the Marechi blood. Still, he knew they were leaving a scent and they would have to wash soon. Thankfully Sanmi looked pretty normal. No strange appendages or skin coloring besides a mark on his cheek. His demon slayer mark. Not a demonic mark, although his tongue. He glanced behind him to see said tongue lash out of the wind pillar's mouth, almost like another appendage, and winced. He looked ahead of them again, bouncing off of and through the tree branches as fast as he could without leaving Shinazugawa behind. Then they came across a stream and he immediately stopped, dropping onto the bank and looking around. He couldn't see or sense anything other than the two of them. 
Then he looked over at Shinazugawa who had landed in a crouch. Kenjiro had put the man's legs near his body after he'd pumped a small amount of blood into Shinazugawa, hoping that they would reconnect. And they had, which was very good as the last thing he wanted was to be running around with a half-naked demon at his beck and call. That didn't clean the blood on those clothes. They had left a trail, albeit a faint one, but it didn't help that Shinazugawa was chewing on the blood-soaked parts of his shirt, looking extremely disappointed. Yeah, he wouldn't get much from that, Marechi blood or not. Tenjiro sighed. Come on, he said, gesturing to the stream. We need to wash up. We're lucky he isn't on our trail yet. For several seconds, the newly turned demon just stared at him. Then, to the time traveler's disbelief and dismay, he sat down, folded his arms and pouted. Tenjiro blinked at him, then sighed again. Don't make me make you, he said, almost pleading. He hated that he even could make his demons do things against their will. Shinazugawa winced at that, and then, slowly, got to his feet. He crawled on all fours to the stream, hands completely unfazed by any sharp rocks he may or may not have run into, and frowned at the water. Then he looked back up at Tenjiro, almost as if to plead. Go on, he said as he would talk to one of his younger siblings. The wind pillar frowned mutinously, but got into the water and began washing the blood out of his shirt fairly competently. Pinching the bridge of his nose, Tenjiro sent a prayer to his father that he'd help him with patience, and then joined the other demon in the river, washing what he could. It was really a shame he'd lost his shoes. He'd just broken them in. But they'd gotten away from Kokushibo. That was the most important thing. That and figuring out how to beat him next time. He stood straight and looked around, throwing his senses out. But again, couldn't find anything. Had Kokushibo not even tried to follow them? Had his fire been that detrimental to him? One could only hope, he supposed. He went back to washing the blood out of his pants, shirt and Hayori. Hmm, he'd have to get a new one of those too. Pity, and Shinobu was supposed to meet them. He suddenly groaned. If Shinobu hadn't left the Yubayashiki estate today, she would leave tomorrow. They had to get to the estate and intercept her. He glanced at Shinazugawa who had just sat down in the water and was now staring angrily at him. He'd have to intercept her in hope she didn't kill him on the spot for this. He groaned again and sat down in the river too. He'd find positivity in the situation in a moment. For now he needed to rest. XXX. Yuzen had known Kokushibo for over 400 years. He knew the man to be aloof, cool and in control of himself. That was why the person who fell through Nakheim's door after screaming out her name downright shocked him for the first time in centuries. He'd seen the man angry, hungry, frustrated and determined. He'd never seen Kokushibo lose control like this when hunger had nothing to do with it. Even still falling in on fire. He'd been shouting, cursing and screaming, raving to a point of madness, his eyes fixed on the closing door above him as the flames on his clothing and body slowly faded away. Musin knew that fire. He grit his teeth and walked over to see his snarling waxing moon, ready to lash out at anyone. The demon king concentrated on his arms, growing them and shooting them out, pinning the waxing moon to the ground. You lost. He hissed. Tokushibo wrestled against his bonds angrily, but at least spoke somewhat coherently. He tricked me. The coward tricked me and ran away. I'll kill him. I'll destroy him. I'll. Musin slapped an extra appendage he'd just grown against Kokushibo's mouth. Be silent, he hissed. Fortunately, Kokushibo knew enough, even in his maddened state, to back down. He still didn't look like he could speak without screaming. Then Musin decided to forego any further madness by going directly into his demon's mind. It only took moments to do so. He watched the battle from Kokushibo's eyes and frowned. The boy had put up a spectacular fight for a waxing moon. But, in the end, Musin finished the scene and smiled. The boy was strong, but nowhere near strong enough to defeat him. The boy had lost to his waxing one. There was no way he'd be a threat to Musin. Not a true one. And they'd gotten rid of one more pillar in the process. Retribution. A waxing moon for a pillar. Not nearly a fair enough trade, but one he could live with. Now, if only, um, Kokushibo was off balance and... He did seem weaker. He didn't have as much of Musin's cells inside of him as he'd had before. So the boy could literally burn the cells out of a demon. That was a problem. Although it didn't seem like it could really do much harm in the long run. Not if they stopped this problem as soon as they could. This is the first time in 400 years you have truly disappointed me, he said. And I do not want to spend the time or effort replacing you. As such, the appendage covering his demon's mouth snapped down into Kokushibo's throat. Then the progenitor of demons began to pump more blood into his waxing moon. He loved the look of utter ecstasy on their faces when he gave of his blood. It had been a while since he'd seen Kokushibo like this and he'd almost forgotten. 
He loved inflicting pain, and he loved inflicting this. It hurt them, so not pleasure, per se, but he knew they could sense their own power growing. At least the Kazuki had calmed down. Muzin let him go and he fell to the floor, twitching. That felt good too, seeing such a stoic and controlled man sprawled in front of him, trying to rise to even his elbows and only barely succeeding. I expect better from you next time, the demon king whispered down to him. Yes, Muzin Sama, Kokushibo said. He'd managed to get to his knees, but instead of trying to regain his feet, he turned and bowed before his kami, as he should. Yet another reason why he liked Kokushibo so much. He'd really hate to have to write him off. Good, he said. Then he turned around towards where he could sense Nakaim and called out to her. Call the other waxing moons. We have updates. The woman with the kanji for waxing three in her eye acknowledged him with a twang of her biwa. Muzin turned to walk into the room he would meet the other waxing moons in, feeling both more wary and more sure of where he stood in his plans and where Kamado Tanjiro would fit into them. He'd have to do some new recruiting to take care of the lower-ranked slayers, but he could move forward with his plans of destroying the Demon Slayer Corps altogether very, very soon. Shinobu wished she could have brought Kano for this mission, but at the same time, she didn't want her younger sister around Kamado. She wasn't even sure why, except that he was a demon, or becoming a demon, or perhaps the fact that his blood could turn other people into demons and just a couple of drops of his blood ate through and converted an entire liter of their precious store of demon blood in less than an hour. Closer to 20 minutes, actually, and she suspected that a circulatory blood system would speed that up to minutes. Humans converted at a slightly slower rate, according to the tests she'd run and each of the blood samples had had their own uniqueness, just as most of Musin's demons did. It actually even converted animal blood, although at the slowest rate so far. The more intelligent the animal, the faster the rate of conversion. Insects and other bugs didn't convert at all. Musins didn't convert insects either, unless one counted demons as bugs. That test, actually, had taken her the longest to wrap up and conclude. It was part of the reason why she'd insisted on staying behind to finish her observations. Was it wrong to want to protect her sister from all of this? From Shinobu's own fascination with this new type of demon blood and a demon doctor who had very interesting results and conclusions of her own. She didn't protect Kano from other demon slayer duties. Or maybe it was because she actually believed Kamado, but that encouraged her to let her guard down, which would encourage Kano to do the same. And what if they were all wrong? Was this irrational? Sooner or later, her little sister would have to meet Kamado. Until then, though, Shinobu sighed and looked up at the treetops along the sides of the road. She was just getting into forest territory and would be able to travel faster. She did want to reach the final selection area by morning, and she'd have to stop for a mission on the way. She'd need to arrive at that city by nightfall. She was considering when she should abandon the actual road and take to the trees when a voice called out to her. Shinobu-san. Blinking, she looked ahead and saw a figure jumping through the trees she'd just considered. It took her only a moment to recognize Kamado rushing towards her and Shinna's Yugawa just behind him. Something about that struck Shinobu as odd. The younger Hashira looked so relieved for a moment, and then, to her surprise, he stopped, simply froze in mid-step on a tree, still a fair distance away. Then he turned to face Shinna's Yugawa. She couldn't hear their conversation, but simply continued to approach them as the wind pillar glared angrily at Kamado. Eventually, he very reluctantly sat down on a larger tree branch. The sun pillar nodded as if satisfied and then turned to rush over to Shinobu. It bothered her that Shinna's Yugawa turned his face towards her and just stared. She couldn't tell if he was blinking, but she didn't think so. Kamado landed on the road in front of her. Looking so relieved again he immediately bent over and put his hands on his knees, breathing hard. Not that hard, though, and his pants had been sliced in very strange places, as had both his Hayori sleeve and his Demon Slayer outfit's sleeve on one arm. She could also swear she'd seen glowing red eyes, not his normal burgundy. Kamado-san, she said, closing her eyes and smiling wide. Wasn't I supposed to meet you at Mount Fukujika-san? And what, exactly, is wrong with Shinna's Yugawa-san? He actually winced at that, his Hanafuda earrings clattering against his cheeks. And then he looked up and Shinobu's eyes narrowed. Kamado-san, is that kanji written in your eyes? He sighed. Yes, it's a holdover from my previous lives, much like the demon transformation. Hem, a waxing moon. She may or may not have sounded rather accusatory at that. The boy shuffled, looking down and kicking the ground with his bare feet. His bare, clawed feet. It's not like I had a choice. His previous arguments about how most demons didn't choose to become flesh-eating monsters made a great deal more sense with that point. Hem, she responded. Does Oyakata Sama know? This time he stared her right in the eyes and nodded firmly. I've told him more or less everything. 
I see. This both explained so much and brought to light even more questions. Why had his cells mutated as they had? Was that partially due to his demon blood art, living so many lives, being turned so many times, becoming a waxing moon? Or was there more to it? She rather suspected the latter. For several seconds, she studied him, looking for any sign of smugness, superiority or even just amusement, but she found only determination and perhaps guilt. Then she glanced back up at Shinazugawa. He hadn't moved from his spot, and he hadn't stopped staring at her. And Shinazugawa-san, another flinch and the boy looked down again. I don't know how or why, but we ran into waxing one, Kokushibo. He ambushed us just after my first attempt at cleansing a demon. Tee. How did it go? She interrupted. She always had been too curious for her own good. The cleansing, I mean. The boy blinked. Um, and then he deflated. I managed to burn the demonic cells out of him but he died. I tried to save him. Even tried to breathe for him like Tameo-san taught me but Shinobu frowned. He died, but didn't disintegrate. Kamado stiffened a little but nodded. His body didn't have any demonic traits that I could see but he paused and winced again. Shinobu-san, it's like torture to them. At least slicing necks is fast and relatively painless. I, I don't know if I can do that again. She put one hand on her hip and the other cupped her chin as she thought. Should she believe him? Can Shinazugawa-san confirm this? And there was that wince yet again. Not, right now. She frowned. Please continue explaining then. Yeah, he muttered. The demon's shrieks were, very loud. I'm pretty sure that's what attracted Kokushibo. He shook his head. I told Shinazugawa-san to stay out of the fight, and when it became clear that I would not likely win, I told him to run. Shinobu knew exactly what reaction that would bring. He didn't, did he? She said facetiously. It wasn't a question. Kamado still answered it with a shake of his head. The waxing first. He's terrifying. I've never had to seriously fight him, not since I got the ability to become a waxing moon myself. It only happened twice in the loops, twice too many, but he could actively kill demons or absorb them, so very few demons actually tried to fight him for his position. Then how did you gain your rank? Kamado's jaw clenched, as did his hands, and his eyes grew hard. My rank was never meant to recognize power. Nuzin wanted me to overcome the sun for him. That was the only reason he set me apart. Yeah, that sounded less than pleasant, to say the least. She didn't let her sympathy blind her, though. Did you? She asked. He blinked. Did I what? Conquer the sun for him. The steely gaze returned, frightening with his new eye color and kanji. No, never. No matter what he tried, that could go some very dark places. She contemplated pushing him, but ultimately decided not to as this was not the best place or time for such conversations. And Shinazugawa-san, Kamado rubbed the back of his head uncomfortably. When I fought, well, I can beat Dauma. It isn't an easy fight, but I can do it. I thought I'd stand a chance against one but, this time, I fought Kokushibo, and lost. He held up his tattered sleeve and then gestured to his equally ruined pants. I managed to keep my sword, but, well, Shinazugawa-san. He stepped in between us to give me time to regenerate. I'm not the best at regeneration. It's something I'll have to work on. Maybe Akatsuki can help me. He regenerates almost instantly. He looked up with a hopeful, almost excited smile at Shinobu, but it faded when he saw her unimpressed expression. Oh, right. Waxing one got past Shinazugawa-san and tried to kill me again. I still had my sword, like I said, but that only stalled him. Shinazugawa-san got a hit on him because he was distracted with me. It sliced off his arm and he, um, cut Shinazugawa-san in half in retaliation. Shinobu's eyes went wide and her breath hitched, but then she looked back up at the figure in the tree, if he was, and then she put it together. Kamado's reluctance and his state in Shinazugawa and, oh, oh, you, turned him into a demon. I couldn't just let him die, Kamado exclaimed, but then he sighed again. I actually expected him to be like Akaza, or Akatsugi, thought he'd be, you know, his normal self but with weird cravings and fangs. I take it that isn't the case, Shinobu asked, eyeing Shinazugawa warily. Kamado shook his head, suddenly looking so, so tired. He can't even talk yet, although he seems to understand me. Just like Nezuko, he cut off and closed his eyes for a moment as if to gather himself. Then he turned his red gaze back on her again. He needs to sleep. He needs a quiet, safe place. And um, I kind of do too. She frowned and looked up at the distant white and black clad figure staring at her still. Knowing the truth made his actions both more and less creepy. That puts me in a difficult position, she said with a sigh of her own. I also have a mission I need to accomplish, so I cannot escort you back to the Yubayashiki estate. I'm also not entirely comfortable letting two demons go off on their own. He looked a little green and ducked his head, not denying it, then. So, did that mean his transformation was complete? 
or had he simply recognized his denial? She supposed it didn't matter at this point. Although, she said, her eyes a little softer, I am glad you came back on your own. That is a point in your favor. Kamado smiled wanly up at her. Thank you, Shinobu-san. But then his grin fell. Although Jenya's going to kill me. Hum, she said, only having met Shinazugawa Jenya once. Honestly, she could believe he'd try. Of course, that's if Shinazugawa-san doesn't regain himself and kill you first. This time the demon groaned and let his face fall into his hands. Thus he didn't see Shinobu cover her mouth with her hand. He's not going to understand, is he? She smiled, genuine for once, if a little pitying. I don't think so. In any case, shall we go? He sighed and nodded, letting his hands drop back to his sides. Yeah, let's go. But I'll have to keep Shinazugawa-san back. I don't think he's trustworthy around humans yet. I assume you haven't let him eat any human flesh. The boy shook his head emphatically. No, I've kept him away from towns and travelers as best I can. So you have the same kind of control over him that you have over Akatsugi. She asked as she began walking towards Shinazugawa's tree. He hesitated. Yeah, he finally answered, subdued. Not complete control, thank the kami, but definitely enough to make him stay in that tree or not attack you. Oh, I can take care of myself if he misbehaves, she said, widening her smile again. Half because it was true, half in warning. Kamado, surprisingly, smiled right back. I know you can, Shinobu-san. I was more worried that he would die more than you. I saved him and I guess he's one of mine now. That means it falls to me to protect him. She honestly couldn't tell whether he was joking or not. Somehow, she leaned towards not. Whether he was lying and playing them all or not, this boy truly was amazing. Shinazugawa-san, Kamado said as he and Shinobu reached the tree he was perched in. He had gotten onto all fours and was peering at her, drool dribbling down from his mouth along with his very large, long, purple tongue. Yeah, she would stay away from those implications. Down that path lay madness. This is Kacho Shinobu-san. I know you are hungry, but you are not allowed to eat her. Am I clear? The new demon with his bright purple, slitted eyes, snarled at them. Kamado just shook his head, smiling. Nope. If you try, I will stop you. But soon we'll get to a safe place and you can rest, okay? All that met his words was a rumbling growl. Somehow, that struck Shinobu as still very much like Shinazugawa. Come on, we're going to follow her and make sure she stays safe, okay? The grumbling growl stopped. Okay, Kamado said brightly then turned to Shinobu. Your lead, Shinobu-san. Well, this would be an interesting trip. XXX, Kamado-san, Shinobu said brightly, making sure to keep one eye on Shinazugawa as they traveled. He hadn't approached her, but he also hadn't stopped staring at her. It was getting unnerving. Yes, Shinobu-san, do you think we could continue experimenting with your blood art once we reach the village, assuming, of course, that there is a demon behind the disappearances in the town? She expected an immediate answer of either yes or no, and managed to glance at him when she received neither before returning her gaze to the wind pillar. He looked troubled. I don't know, Shinobu-san. I know they're demons but I am too. Now, he sounded so dejected. Not that she blamed him. My blood art hurts them. Badly. I don't want to torture them if I don't have to. Hmm, she responded thoughtfully. Then she smiled again. Did you forget that I am a doctor who specializes in substances that affect demons? He blinked at her, then frowned as if he was trying to put that together. She sighed inwardly. What if I told you I had a poison that could render them unconscious? If he answered no, then he was either traumatized or playing them. If he answered yes, though, you do. That would be great. I mean, you just have to make sure they don't see me and that they're knocked out. I think the pain the previous demon went through was part of the reason they died afterwards. But if I can save them... If you can save them, then I will gladly help in any way I can, Kamado-san. Even though she knew he couldn't see her, she still smiled at him. Shinazugawa growled at her. She just shot him an unimpressed expression and pointedly kept her hand on her blade. If he so much as twitched wrong, she'd slap so much poison in him, he'd be dead before he hit the ground. Even if she really didn't want to do that to him. She'd known him almost since she'd first joined the Corps. After several moments of companionable silence, she spoke again. I'm surprised he can go into the sun. Yeah, Kamado replied. I mean, everything else about him is just like a newly turned demon. But I guess since I've conquered the sun, then so has he. She heard the uneasiness in his voice clearly. You really don't like having control over them. Akatsugi and Shinazugawa, I mean. Kamado's jaw clenched. No, I mean, it's useful, sure. But isn't that part of the problem? I really don't want to get used to this. Um, she replied easily. 
When he spoke like that, she found she could believe he'd lived almost a hundred lifetimes. They continued in silence. XXX. Sanmi was hungry, but he couldn't eat. And part of him didn't want to eat, but most of him wanted to eat everything. But Master wouldn't let them eat. It was bad to eat people, he said. So the new lady wasn't food either, despite how good she smelled. Not as good as that smell from earlier, but still good. And how there were a lot of other scents of other people, but he couldn't eat them either. I will head into the city, then, Kamado-san, the new lady, Kacho. Yes, that was her name, he was sure of it, said with a smile that hid knives. I recommend that you and Shinazugawa-san stay here to avoid. She glanced over at Sanmi, temptation. Master also looked over at Sanmi, as if he were a child he needed to watch over, which was ridiculous. Sanmi could take care of himself. He was sure of it. Yeah, good luck. I might wander around the outskirts if we get restless. He smiled at Sanmi and somehow that just made him want to scowl more. The tasty smelling lady frowned. Be careful, Kamado-san. The disappearances in the town seem to happen in certain places near water. So, a water-based demon, Master nodded. We'll be vigilant. And if we come across the demon, we'll take care of them. The woman smiled. It didn't seem so. Angry this time. She handed over some cloth to Master, something they'd discussed before. Sammy couldn't remember. It was hard to remember. Except he could, if he really tried. But he was more focused on how hungry he was. I'm trusting you, Kamado-san. The woman said, then turned to leave them. I appreciate it. I won't let you down. Master yelled after her. Then he put the cloth over his hair, tied it, and took off his earrings. He also took off his Hayori. It still smelled kind of good from that smell of that delicious blood last night, but... Then he turned to Sanmi. I'm going to look a little weird, but if I roll my sleeves and pants legs up, it'll hide the slashes and cuts so I'll be less recognizable, in case the demon sees me. Then he studied the newly turned demon with a frown. Can you take off your Hayori, Shinazugawa-san? It's kind of recognizable and I don't want Muzin to know you're still alive if we can help it. If you're comfortable with it, maybe take off your shirt. Er, what's left of it? Sanmi didn't want to, but Master sounded reasonable. So, grudgingly, he did take off his Hayori. It wasn't long because he didn't like it flapping in the wind, so he'd always rolled it up. For some reason, that thought flitted through his mind and then vanished again, leaving only the barest echo of his dislike of flapping fabric. Master looked him over, then shook his head. Demons dressed as demon slayers are still going to draw attention, but hopefully less attention if we take care of it quickly. Well, Shinazugawa-san, let's go hunt some other demons. All Sami heard was the word hunt and he found himself grinning. Finally he could eat. Master sighed. Of course that's what you'd latch on to. Then again, I remember. Well, kind of, what it was like. Yeah, I don't blame you, Sanmi san I hope it's okay to call you that. I hate being this hungry all the time, but sleeping helps. We'll get you someplace safe soon. Okay. Sanmi expected his anger again, but instead he found himself relaxing. Master knew and was trying to help. He was just trying to help everyone, not just Sanmi. It still didn't make him happy, but he nodded. The boy smiled and that smile practically shone like the sun. Would you like to lead the way then, Sanmi san Sanmi felt a wolfish grin on his face as he leapt into the trees. Master followed. Every couple of jumps, Sanmi would stop and sniff the air. He didn't remember having a really good sense of smell, but something about the changes on the wind could tell him things. He wasn't sure how or why, so he didn't question it further. Everything he sensed, though, told him of people in the village or working in some of the fields. They were predictable and Master said they were off-limits, so he concluded they were looking for something unusual. He didn't know how long they'd been searching, but the sun had long since set and everyone had gone back to the village for the night except for a few stragglers and some smaller humans being very energetic near one of the ponds. Children, his mind supplied. Children playing. Why did that make him so sad? And then he sensed something else. Strange movement in the water, which affected the air which affected him. He immediately took off in that direction. S. Sanmi Sam. Master called after him, but didn't call him back, so Sanmi went on. He sensed Master following. Then he heard Master say, Oh. Sanmi kept heading towards the children, who had all stopped. Sanmi came into view and saw a beautiful, glowing woman standing on the lake, floating towards them, actually, just above the water. She held her hands out to her sides peacefully, but Sanmi could sense her blood lust. That was what they'd come here to hunt. He grinned, paused on one particular tree, knowing instinctively just the right angle, and launched himself forward, across the water, colliding with the woman and sending both of them screeching into the shallow part of the pond filled with reeds. He heard the children scream behind him but couldn't bring himself to care. Master would handle that. He wanted his hunt. What are you doing? The woman, no longer glowing or floating, shrieked at him. 
She had yellow-gray skin that dripped with water and angry, snake-yellow eyes. This is my hunting area. Sami just grinned and pounced on her. This would be fun. XXX. Tanjiro reached the pond just in time to see Sami san attack what looked like a glowing apparition. The children, teenagers his age or younger, all started shrieking. The time traveler sighed, but quickly hopped through the reedy grass over to the group. Those are demons, he said breathlessly as he entered the clearing. W. What? One of the children, an older boy, asked shakily. You need to leave, Tanjiro insisted, in case she escapes. As she, another child, an older girl, asked. What's wrong with your eyes? Yet another girl asked fearfully. You have kanji written in your eyes. And they glow, the first girl whispered. Tanjiro tried not to let that get to him and smiled without showing his teeth. It's a long story. But the pretty lady sounded nice, one of the younger girls suddenly piped up, hiding behind one of the older boys as she spoke. Tanjiro shook his head. I'm a demon slayer, and I can promise you that she was not a nice person. He bent down and looked her in the eyes. Just because someone looks nice doesn't mean they are. Why you're a demon slayer? The first boy asked, incredulous. But you're younger than me. I'm 14. Actually, Tanjiro corrected him with a smile. He forgot not to show his teeth. The boy gasped. Why you're a demon too? Another boy, about Takio's age, whispered. Tenjiro sighed and rubbed the back of his head. Yeah, but I'm still a demon slayer too. It's, like I said, a long story. I just don't think demons eating humans is right. He was going to go on, but a shrill scream broke through the evening, causing everyone there to jump. Um, yeah, Tenjiro decided to hurry them out of there. We'll take care of the demon, but you all need to go home, please. Some of the children had already started running. The ones who remained nodded in fear and turned to follow their friends. Once they were out of view, Tanjiro jumped over the tall reeds and grass towards where he heard the fight going on. How dare you? I'll destroy you. The water demon, who now looked more like she'd drowned than like she'd been turned into a demon, shrieked at Sanmi-san. Sanmi-san who had blood around his mouth. Tanjiro's blood ran cold. The time traveler watched carefully as Sanmi-san dove for the woman again going for her neck, as he should, but with his claws. He hadn't even drawn his sword. Oh, wait. He didn't have his sword. Tenjiro hadn't had time to grab that and the rest of Sami Sen's body. They'd have to fix that. Maybe once he could speak again. The woman shrieked again and Tenjiro drew his own sword, waiting for the moment he knew Sami Sen wouldn't be in the way. Then he remembered Shinobu-san's desire to test his fire ability more and paused. The woman stood, half in anger, half in fear as she held her arm which was slowly beginning to grow back. That and her neck. What even are you, savage? She hissed. Sanmi-san hadn't seemed any more savage than any other demon to him. Puzzled, Tenjiro looked over at Sanmi-san and gasped. He had an arm in his mouth, the same one the woman was growing back. Sanmi-san, Tenjiro whispered. Well, that explained the blood. XXX. O-M-A-K-E. Tenjiro's hidden demon art. Head trauma. Idea from C-A-L-I-C-0. Kokushibo's sword came for Tanjiro's neck and he couldn't block it this time. He was still regrowing his limbs so he had limited options. It seemed he would have to use that. Demon blood art. Headbutt of doom. He yelled as he thrust his head down. It worked. Getting in the way of Kokushibo's blade. That won't W. Waxing one started, but cut off with a strangled sound. Shinazugawa stared with a dropped jaw. Was it really that big of a deal? So Kokushibo's blade had split in half. It wouldn't be the first time he'd had to utilize that technique in his time loops. The demon jumped back, just staring at his blade as it regrew and then looked over at Tanjiro as his limbs finished growing. He shot to his feet and took another stance. Thanks, mom, he thought to himself with a smile. That was when Shinna's Yugawa once again drew attention to himself. What? Tanjiro continued to hide in the reeds with a hand over his mouth as he watched the fight in front of him. Or the slaughter. It would have been had Sanmi-san been able to kill the woman with his claws, all while keeping her severed hand in his mouth. It reminded him of Akaza with his own hand. And the whole situation just made him sick. Had he waited too long? Should he have tried to get Sanmi-san somewhere safe earlier so he could sleep? Was it his fault Sanmi-san had turned on other demons? He knew how aching that hunger was. Knew how debilitating it could be. Then another thought occurred to him. Was this even really a bad thing? After all Genya ate demons. Tenjiro hated that he'd even thought it, but it was a valid question. To be honest, he hadn't noticed how good her blood smelled up until now. He'd killed other demons since he'd lost his ability to eat human food. But he was just so used to fighting the hunger he hadn't noticed that they did smell good. Very good. In fact, he realized his own mouth was watering. 
and upon further thought, it made sense too. Musin cells longed for more human cells to convert into energy. If his cells could turn both humans and demons, then it would make sense that he would crave demons too. That didn't make him feel any better. Yeah, he needed to put an end to this. Flash dance, he whispered, shunting energy into his legs and appearing behind the still shrieking woman. Then he chopped her in the neck with his hand. Funny how even demons could be knocked out like that. Well, if they were still remotely human in any case. Sami san immediately stopped, then sat back and chewed as he watched Tenjiro bind the woman's arms behind her back. He made no more moves to attack. The teenager nodded at him, and then sat down on the woman's back, just in case. He did not want her to escape if she woke up. Then he put his head in his hands, trying to ignore how good she smelled. Shinobu-san's going to kill us both. He muttered, then looked over at the newly turned demon. He held the arm away, protectively, as if expecting Tenjiro to take it or something. At that moment, he just couldn't do it. It wasn't like the woman wouldn't grow another arm and Sane Nisan had already fed on her by the looks of it. So what was the point? In the end, if it could satiate some of Sane Nisan's hunger, then he couldn't begrudge him. Much, so he just shook his head and looked away, figuring Shinobu-san would be here shortly. The kids would have told someone about the demons by the pond and she'd likely hear of it. He wasn't wrong. Almost 20 minutes later, the insect pillar landed nearby. XXX. Shinobu rushed through the path surrounding the town she'd been investigating, hoping she hadn't made a mistake, hoping Kamado hadn't taken them all in, and dragged Sami with him. He'd asked her to call him Shinazugawa-san, but she couldn't help but think of him as Kani had called him. And now he was a demon, just another tie to her sister lost. She'd go back to calling him Shinazugawa when she knew he was alright. All things considered, she fought down the sick feeling in her stomach and hurried on. Eventually, she caught the scent of blood and hurried towards the area. Jumping high into the air, she spotted a flatted circle of reeds and made for that, studying the area as she landed. Sami crouched at the edge of the cleared area, far calmer than she'd seen him as a demon. He looked very content to sit on the reeds and simply studied her as she came into view. It wasn't nearly as intense as before. He also had blood around his mouth. Shinobu felt her heart freeze in her chest. Filing that away for later, the insect Hashira turned to Kamado. He looked halfway between despondent and thoughtful, sitting on top of the body of a woman. Once the insect pillar straightened up, though, he looked over at her with a bright smile and waved at her. We caught the demon, he said, hand thumping on the woman's back lightly. Indeed her hands were bound and she looked to be sleeping. So, not a dead human. A small weight lifted from her chest, but this wasn't over yet. Shinobu returned his smile, although she was sure he could sense her anger at the entire situation and how scared she'd been. Several children came rushing into town screaming about three demons that had attacked them. She commented as sweetly as she could, emphasizing that there had been multiple accounts of multiple demons involved. Kamado just shook his head. No, Shinazugawa-san attacked the demon attacking them, and I warned them to go home. He pointed to his face, and honestly, that did explain a lot. The insect pillar frowned and thought back, but his story did match up with the physical evidence she'd seen. None of the children were hurt beyond scrapes and bruises that I saw, she conceded. But then she looked at Sami suspiciously. Why does Shinazugawa-san have blood around his mouth? The sun pillar sighed, sounding utterly exhausted. She wondered when he'd slept last, and wasn't his sleeping also how he gained energy? How was he still going if he hadn't rested for? Who knew how long? Tenjiro spoke. Musin's demons eat humans because his cells use human cells as both fuel and a way to reproduce, like viruses. Shinobu nodded with a frown, as she'd long since known that. My cells convert both human and Musin cells. Musin's demons eat humans. And I can't believe I didn't realize this before, but apparently my demons can eat Musin's demons. Shinobu's eyes widened in surprise and she allowed her smile to fall, eyebrows furrowing in thought instead. That made a surprising amount of sense. Still, you didn't notice any hunger for demons before. He shook his head sadly. Shinobu-san, I am literally hungry all the time. I'm very used to ignoring it, around demons or not. She conceded the point with a nod, then continued to puzzle it out. Not that she had much left to do except really cement it in her mind. So you and Shinazugawa-san, and presumably Akatsuki-san, are demons who can eat other demons, she concluded. Specifically Musin's demons. Another sigh. Supposedly. I mean, Jenna-san can eat demons, so it could be something like that. But with how I react to, Kimado shot her a smile that looked, well, false, almost forced. She didn't answer for several seconds. When she did, her voice was calmer and more understanding than she expected it to be. This must really bother you for you to give me such an obviously fake smile. She'd always wondered how his smiles had been so real. 
It hit home how much he hated his current situation. Somehow, she didn't think that was something he could fake. The red-eyed boy blinked, then deflated and looked straight ahead at the water of the pond he'd been facing. I have to see the good in things. It used to come so naturally to me. I was definitely a glass-half-full kind of person. But, especially lately, it's just been so hard. I never wanted to become a monster, but I did it to save my family. I will always maintain I made the right choice. But I've lost something in these resets. Maybe my innocence. Maybe my positivity. Maybe both. I have to stay positive, though. Even if I have to force it, I can't let that go. It's, sometimes I feel like it's all I have left of me. The one thing I refuse to let him take away from me. He glanced over at Shinna's Yugawa, who was also watching him intently, a troubled expression on the newer demon's face. That was the most expression she'd seen on that face in the last day. The worst part, Kamado continued, is how I'm not sure this is a negative development. Eating other demons. He faded off and scoffed sadly, we're demon slayers anyway. Isn't it a good thing we have another food source? One that won't actually die or be permanently maimed if we follow those instincts. And yet, it will still hurt them, so. What does that make me when I'm even contemplating it? When I'm feeling so little guilt over it? He suddenly looked more like an old man than a teenager as he gazed back out at the silver water shining under the moonlight. Have I really fallen so far? Have I let him drive me to this? Shinobu wanted to hug him, which downright shocked her. He just looked so lost for a moment and she realized that he'd never looked anything but sure and firm before. Still, she wasn't good at pep talks or comfort, and she still had some clarifying questions she felt she had to ask. Tentatively, she decided to voice them. Have you eaten the demon? He shook his head slowly and she felt herself relax a little, even if she wasn't sure why. Do you want to? She ventured. He snorted. Yes, Shinobu couldn't help if her breath caught a little, but then the boy deflated. And no, it feels like losing. But I'm not entirely sure if it is. They're demons, and even though I empathize with them, even though I'm more often than not one of them, I know they have to be eliminated. I know they tend to hurt innocent people. But I don't want them to suffer. Being a demon is punishment enough. Chopping off arms and legs just so I can eat them. He shook his head. I was supposed to come with Shinna's Yugawa-san to try and learn to help demons, maybe even save them, turn them back to human. He licked his lips, ignoring the tears coming to his eyes. Not this. She wanted to sigh, but managed to hold it in, although when she spoke, she couldn't help but be gentle. Sometimes missions go awry. He snorted. Oh, I know. But this just seems. He stopped. Bigger than normal. She asked. Kamado turned to look up at her with those glowing, red eyes and the kanji written in them. For once, they didn't scare her. He almost looked hopeful through the heartbreak. Yeah, finally allowing herself to sigh. She squatted down so they were closer to the same level. She was short. She wasn't that short. Maybe you should go and visit your family after this. The boy blinked, eyes widening. But then he looked down. I'm not sure they'll let me. Would you? Well, probably not. But, at this point it seemed like it may fix more problems than it hurt. If I volunteer to accompany you, then I'm sure Oyakata sama will approve it. If she thought he'd looked hopeful before, it was nothing compared to now. His face practically lit up. Really, Shinobu-san, you'd do that. When she smiled this time, it felt real. Yes, then, to her surprise, he lunged forward and hugged her. Thank you, thank you, thank you. She stiffened a little, but then relaxed when she realized he wasn't hurting her, that he had no intention of hurting her. It took her a moment to understand that she may have just been converted completely to his side. He was just so real that didn't even really approach what she'd like to describe about him, but it would have to do for now. She was not, nor had she ever been, a poet or linguist. After a moment he released her and sat back, rubbing the back of his head sheepishly. Uh, sorry about that. I, he was cut off by a shriek below him as the demon finally woke. Where am I? What? No. Savages. Monsters. I will kill you all. Kamado turned and grabbed her hands before she could break the bonds. Um, Shinobu-san. He asked. She smiled and drew her sword, currently filled with and covered in paralytic poison. Enough of it should also knock the demon out. Then she glanced at Kamado and nodded for him to look away. He'd had enough hardship today. This was something she could do for him at least. He looked so gratefully at her before he did turn to look away that she knew she'd made the right decision. The demon screamed as she stabbed her sword down, and Kamado flinched, but he didn't look back or let up his hold. Almost immediately, the woman's struggling began to die down and then stop altogether. Once she was still again, Kamado let out a breath and smiled wanly. She won't feel anything. Shinobu shrugged. She shouldn't. It was the best she could do. He nodded. Okay then. With that, he stood. She didn't move. Shinobu had been prepared in case the demon had been resistant somehow. 
It hadn't ever happened. But that didn't mean she shouldn't consider the possibility. Shinobu backed away, ending up standing beside where Shinazugawa crouched. He looked up at her, an unreadable expression on his face, but then he looked back at Kamado. Demon blood art, palm fire, the boy said as he put his now glowing hand on the woman's back. Then he stood again as it spread over her body. She didn't so much as twitch. For several minutes, they sat there in the dark watching a pink bonfire around the woman as Kamado concentrated. Due to the distortion of the fire, Shinobu couldn't tell if it was doing anything. Nearly ten eternally long minutes later, Kamado let the fire die and he looked up at Shinobu. I can't sense any more demon in her. I also burned away some of the poison. Shinobu took a deep breath and carefully approached the woman. She looked normal under the moonlight, although her skin seemed particularly pale. She hadn't stirred. Slowly, the insect pillar put her hand to the woman's neck and felt for a pulse. She definitely found one, small but steady. She's alive, she said. Kamado perked up. But, I don't know anything else about this, Shinobu said as she checked the woman's teeth. Normal, she checked the woman's eyes. They didn't respond, but again, looked normal, dark brown and no slits. This was certainly promising. However, we should get her back to the butterfly estate where I can better care for her. Right, Kamado nodded. I'll carry her. Gently, he lifted the woman into his arms, carrying her bridal style. Lead the way, he asked Shinobu. She nodded and turned to head out, but a voice stopped her. It was low, gravelly from disuse but it froze her in her tracks. Kacho, slowly she turned and looked at Shinazugawa, noting as she did that Kamado had turned his own wide eyes onto the new demon. The white-haired figure looked up at her, face half puzzled, half pained. Kacho, Kenny, he asked. Shinobu's breath caught in her throat at hearing her sister's name, at being mistaken for her sister. They'd been so different. How could he have mistaken her? It took her far too many seconds to recover and plaster a smile onto her face. No, Shinobu, she said, putting a hand on her chest. His expression relaxed a little in realization. Shi, Nabu, she nodded and clapped her hands. Very good, Shinazugawa-san. Okay, that may have sounded a little patronizing. Not that she'd meant it that way. He stood, albeit hunched and ready to pounce, and approached her warily. Sister, she smiled at him. Yes, where is? Sister, her smile vanished and it was all she could do to maintain anything besides her heartbreak. Why did it feel like a wound that would never heal? It took her far too long to work herself up to answering. She's dead. He looked stricken for a moment, then crouched back down. Oh, yeah, forgot. She glanced over at Kamado who didn't seem to know what to make of the situation. Then she focused back on Shinazugawa. What do you remember? She asked gently, unwilling to move any closer to him. His brows furrowed. Too much, he said. Then he shook his head. Not enough. That was actually a good sign. It meant he was thinking far above simple thought processes. You'll remember everything, she finally said, even though she wasn't sure at all. She glanced at Kamado who nodded firmly. At least he believed the same thing, or perhaps he could will it. Hmm, probably not the best time to think on that right now. I think we should hurry back to the butterfly estate. You two aren't the only ones who need some sleep, after all. I'm sure our Kasugai crows have already reported to you by Ashiki-sama. They likely came in just after I left. No, she wasn't bitter about that. At all. Timing was timing and in this case, there was nothing anyone could do about it. Will it take that long for the crows to get back? Kamado asked. Shinobu shrugged. Depends on the crow and how many there are and what news they have. They have to stop and eat and sleep as well. However, if we still haven't heard from Oyakata-sama tomorrow night, we have enough crows that come to the butterfly estate that I'll be able to write to him myself. In any case, we should hurry. She glanced at Shinazugawa, wondering what her expression would say. She wasn't sure exactly what she felt towards him at the moment, especially knowing that of all people, her sister was someone he remembered first. Or one of the first, at least. The first he spoke of, in any case. Then she shot him an empathetic smile. Demons don't tend to stay sated. Kamado snorted at that, sounding entirely too tired and just done. She could relate. You assume a demon's hunger is ever sated. It only becomes less. No one responded and he didn't look at any of them as he went on. Voice quiet enough that Shinobu wasn't sure if he was talking to himself or them. The more powerful a demon becomes, the more they are able to put their hunger to the side in favor of other things they judge as more important. Or that Musen judges to be important. And that, sounded entirely too bitter for the boy she'd come to know. Was that his fatigue talking? Or had he finally dropped his mask of politeness and friendliness? Instead of commenting on it, though, she simply nodded at him and started off through the reeds. They'd have to get back to the main road to find the path that would lead them back to her estate. And she doubted any of them would want to try and find a place to stay in the town. 
Come, quickly, she said before she picked up her pace, ending at a fast but manageable running pace she could keep up for a couple of hours. She heard the other two fall into a rhythm behind her. She'd been one of the youngest pillars ever promoted, and now she had two demons following her home. To make it worse, she would willingly house them before bombarding them with questions once they woke. She would also be taking care of a former demon who was now a human. They hoped, and this could be the beginning of their ability to actually save demons if they played their cards right. How had this become her life? XXX. Oi, Nimoko. What did the crow say? The Zuko blinked and turned to see Inosuke running up to her, followed by an exasperated Zenitsu. It's Nezuko, she reminded him with a smile before she answered his question. I've been called to the Butterfly Estate. It isn't life-threatening or anything, but apparently my brother has been taken there. He's going to go home to see my family and wanted to take me with him. Why you're leaving us? Zenitsu cried. But, Nezuko Chaon, we'll just have to come with you. Inosuke suddenly cut in, nodding as if he'd just found a solution to everything. Zenitsu went from stuttering breaths on the verge of tears to angry in moments. You idiot. He yelled at Inosuke. You can't just invite yourself along to family things. It's rude. Don't you even know that, you stupid boar. You wanna say that again, Tenitsu. It's Zenitsu. That's what I said. Nezuko decided to step in before they really got into their argument and Inosuke decided to attack Zenitsu. Again, I don't mind. But we need to check with my brother and my family again before we do, Nezuko said. Really? Zenitsu asked, all sunshine and smiles. Nezuko could only smile fondly. It worried her, sometimes, how quickly her companion changed moods, but she could also tell he was genuinely happy at the prospect of accompanying her. It was, flattering, and kind of cute, when he wasn't being overly clingy and creepy. This is why I'm the boss, Inosuke said, putting his hands on his hips and puffing out his chest in pride. I come up with good ideas. This is why everyone should listen to me. We'll see, Nezuko stressed. If my brother wants to just talk to family, though, you'll have to remain behind. We won't know until we get to the butterfly estate. Zenitsu had gone back to looking to be on the verge of tears, but Inosuke just folded his arms and nodded. Let's go then. And with that, he took off down the road. Running, of course. Oh oi. Zenitsu called after him. Before he could say anything else, though, Nezuko smiled at him. Let's go, Zenitsu-san. His happy, dreamy expression returned. Right, Nezuko. Race you. She offered, feeling a little mischievous. She had just added a form to her style based on Zenitsu's lightning form. It wasn't nearly as fast, but she could keep it up for longer. He'd likely overtake her on the road, but she'd pass him by once he ran out of steam. She wanted to build up her own stamina reserves, and besides, they needed to catch up with Inosuke. So, without waiting for him to answer, she pushed energy into her legs, concentrating on her breathing and launching off. She'd almost gotten the constant concentration breathing down, although she had yet to be able to do it while she slept and still averaged about three hours at a time before she forgot or something tripped her up. Maybe Tenjiro or Yurikodaki sensei could help her with that. She supposed that depended on what would happen when they got to the butterfly estate. As predicted, it took her a couple of minutes to catch up to Inosuke, and Zenitsu passed them very early on. But they found him sprawled by the side of the road not two kilometers down, reaching out his hand as if he were dying, the drama king. So they stopped for a bit and then started up again once Zenitsu had recovered, this time telling him that if he pulled the same stunt, she and Inosuke would leave him behind. Having him remain somewhat with them while still using his breathing form was worth the wailing and tears. Shinobu, Kamado, Shinazugawa and their guest, patients showed up at the Butterfly Estate just after sunrise. The girls that maintained the estate had already risen and were eating breakfast when Shinobu spoke to them about the situation briefly, and assured them she would explain more thoroughly once she got everyone situated. Then she asked the girls to take their patient to one of the recovery rooms while she took care of Kamado and Shinazugawa. Then she had the two demons follow her towards their cellar. It had been added on long after the estate had been originally built and was sturdy enough to give her at least some peace of mind when it came to demons. That had been its original function. She felt a little bad for taking them to one of the demon holding cells, though. She'd realized that she trusted Kamado. Well, as much as she ever would be able to. But she did not trust Shinazugawa. Not as he was now. Although he'd seemed more compliant since he'd eaten. About then, she realized he wouldn't have been able to eat once he'd been turned, like most demons did. Turning took energy, and he'd been severely wounded. No wonder he'd been so intense about anything he'd considered food. She still doubted that a single arm would have been enough, but it must have been better than nothing. And she also noticed that he'd begun to speak after he ate, and had to write down some of her theories regarding that. Did eating the demon's arm jumpstart his recovery? Was he recovering? 
Would that have simply come with time? Or was it the memory of her sister that had somehow accelerated his growth? Was it just a coincidence and would he simply have started talking whether he'd eaten or not? So many questions she didn't have the answer for. So many implications for both good and ill. This would be a long day, and the least she could do would be to make them comfortable. I have to admit, I would feel more at ease if you and Shinazugawa-san would sleep in the cellar, she finally said to Kamado. He didn't look happy, but nodded. I can't say I blame you, he replied. Shinazugawa just growled, but didn't otherwise protest, so she took that as a win. In any case, I'll need you to help me carry the bedding down to the room you will be staying in. She walked to a closet and began to take down some futons she had stored in there. She didn't often use them as patients were easier to tend to in beds. She was grateful that she had these futons now, though. Will you lock us inside? Kamado asked. Shinazugawa's growl turned defensive, and it bothered her that she could recognize that change in tone. Was that because she'd known him before, or had she just come to know him that well in the last day? Did it really matter? I have to protect my patients and girls, she replied with a smile. I hope you understand. He just sighed again and nodded, as if he'd been expecting that. She refused to let that make her feel any guiltier. Shinazugawa-san, could you carry this futon? She asked. Yeah. He muttered and took it from her, to her surprise and relief. He still didn't sound happy, but he also didn't sound or act like a demon either. Well, mostly. He still crept along in a slouch and walked on all fours part of the time, and the growling. But it was still an improvement. Kamado got the second futon and Shinobu herself decided to carry the blankets as she showed them to the cellar door and then down to the dark rooms below. It had no windows and there would be very little light once they closed the door. I realize you don't need to be away from the sunlight, but I do think this is the best option, she said, going to one of the rooms and opening it. Inside, there was just enough space for two futons. I won't lock the room door, but I will lock the basement door, she informed them. That was the most she was willing to concede. It's more than we could have expected, Kamado said with a bow, as if reading her mind. She decided she really didn't want to think on that possibility either. Shinazugawa growled grumpily and nodded his head. She smiled at them, realizing she'd given more real smiles in the last couple of months than she had since. Well, Kenny, she wasn't quite sure what to think of that. Putting that aside for now, she helped them set up their futons, showed them where the lamps were and how they could light them if necessary. Then she watched them get situated, unwilling to leave them without knowing they'd gone to sleep as they should. Within minutes, they were both breathing evenly, constant concentration even. Interesting. She did call out to them to see if they were still awake, but neither one of them answered. Satisfied, she nodded and turned to go back upstairs. Once there, she locked the door and then took several seconds to just breathe herself because she really didn't know what to think of this whole situation. There was just too much right now, and she needed her own sleep. She also needed to attend to her patient and that came first. Checking vitals and setting her up for observation would take at least an hour at this point, and they'd have to make some more bone broth for her to eat. Just in case, despite wanting to head to bed herself, she stood straight and turned to hurry down the hall towards her patient. She may not get much sleep today, but she could sleep when she died, she supposed. Such was the life of a demon slayer. XXX. Kaya woke slowly, her eyelids felt and difficult to move. Nothing sounded familiar and everything felt different. She didn't know why. The best she could come up with to describe it was, muddy or perhaps blurry. She didn't want to sleep anymore, despite being so tired. But waking up was a trial. Something kept niggling at the back of her mind. Her stomach let out a loud growl. Oh, she was hungry. But it didn't seem so bad for some reason. Eventually, she managed to pry her eyes open and found herself staring at the wooden beams of an old-fashioned ceiling. At least, it looked old, but well-worn and taken care of. She turned her head to look around and found she lay in a bed instead of a futon. She frowned. She didn't remember owning a bed. Those were luxuries for the wealthy, come from the West recently and no one else could afford them. What was she doing in a bed in a wealthy old estate? At least, that was the conclusion she'd come to, and moving to sit up didn't change her mind. Her bed was one of three in a sparsely decorated room away from the shuttered windows. She wanted to shy away from them, but didn't know why. Eventually, she managed to gain a sitting position but it did little to enlighten her more. Had she been brought here for healing? For quarantine? Both? Neither. She remembered so little. She closed her eyes and put a hand to her temple rubbing it in circles as she forced herself to remember. She did recall her dream. Or nightmare. What a terrible dream it had been. She'd become an oni who had killed and eaten people alive. Just the flashes that began to come back made her stomach churn. And she remembered a man. With red-purple eyes, slitted and cruel. He'd offered her something, hadn't he? Oh, right. She'd been sick. And it hadn't gone away. 
He said he could heal her. She opened her eyes and looked around the dimly lit room again. Apparently that had been a dream too. Although being here in this estate at least let her know she'd gotten some help. Actually, she felt better than she had in over a year. She smiled, as you must have gone to some great lengths to get her illness treated. She looked forward to seeing Itsuko and Chiyo again. Ezium had kept them away once she'd gotten sick, for fear of spreading her illness. Had he sent them away to family? She couldn't remember. It was coming back, but still felt fuzzy, like it had all been another life. After effects of the illness, Kaio sighed and then realized she had to relieve herself. With how her body felt, this likely wouldn't be a fun experience. Still, she braced herself and moved the blankets aside. Then she forced her heavy, heavy legs to move. They hurt. A lot. She managed to get to her feet and steady herself by the bed. She'd need a comb for the mess her hair had become, but she supposed that was what came of laying in bed for. Who knew how long? Once she was sure of her footing, she began to walk towards the door. It was slow going, but she felt firmer and better the more she moved. She'd almost reached the door when it opened suddenly, startling her. She let out a surprise sound and tried to catch herself, but didn't have the coordination. She fell to the floor with a thump, registering a shriek coming from whoever had opened the door. Then she looked up to see a girl with pigtails on either side of her head, each held with a butterfly clip. She wore a white shift over a dark uniform similar to what she'd seen the police wear in recent years. But why would the police have brought her here? Was her illness that dangerous? The girl just stared at her for several seconds and she stared right back until she realized how undignified she looked in her white hatajuban, sprawled on the ground simply from being startled. She tried to regain her feet. Please excuse me, she said as she focused on her hand-eye coordination. You startled me. I simply needed to relive myself. Oh, let me help you, the girl said, sounding a little unsure. But her hands were steady as she helped Kayo to her feet. Thank you, the older woman smiled at her. Are you an apprentice here? The girl tensed for a moment, but then nodded slowly. Kanzaki AI, at your service. Well, only nodding was a little rude, but she was also young and it wasn't Kayo's place to say anything. My family recently adopted the name Suzuki, and I am Kayo, she said with a bow. She had to concentrate to not fall over again. The girl seemed to study her for several seconds before nodding to the nearest bed. Before I can let you leave the room, I must check you over. Kayo supposed that was fair enough, even if the idea of backtracking didn't appeal to her. Still, she managed to get to the bed and sat down. The girl began looking her over, checking her hands, asking her to open her mouth, checking her eyes and ears as well as her feet. Once she finished with the cursory check, she took a step back and put her hands on her hips as if puzzled. How do you feel? She asked. Sore, Kayo answered truthfully. It feels difficult to move my arms and legs as if I'm moving through water, but otherwise better than I've felt in a long while. I see, the girl said, a calculating look in her eye. You are sick, correct? Kayo frowned. Shouldn't the girl know that? But she nodded anyway. What were your symptoms before? Something wasn't right here. But Kayo saw no reason to withhold her answer. I had difficulty eating and pain in my stomach, as well as my side here. She pointed to her left rib area under her armpit. It very slowly spread and was making my daily life very difficult. I thank you for your and your master's help in my healing because that has completely vanished. I feared it would be the death of me. The girl looked a little stricken for a moment before her face returned to her usual stern expression. Then she nodded. If you would like to relieve yourself, please follow me. Why did Kayo feel as if the girl was hiding something from her? To her surprise, the girl led her to a sectioned off part of the estate and showed her to a room instead of a wood-covered pit outside as Kayo was used to. It seemed to be a strangely covered pit inside with a bowl-like structure over it. What is that? She asked. The girl blinked, then slowly ventured. I know this might sound like a strange question, Suzuki-san, but what year did you get sick? Kayo couldn't help but be taken aback at the question. Seven Meiji by the reckoning of the Meiji government. The girl just blinked. I see. This is a western invention called a toilet. You sit on it and do your business. She seemed a little uncomfortable with that as she explained, but it wasn't exactly polite conversation. Necessary, perhaps, and so understandably awkward. Thank you, Kayo said, once the girl finished, hoping to alleviate her worry before going in and closing the door. It was strange, but she could see why the people of the West had come up with such a simple concept. Once finished, Kanzaki showed her back to her room. The walk had done her good, and she felt better about controlling her body again. But the trip had also tired her out. Still, she had questions she wanted answered. Could she see her family soon? What was going on with her treatment? 
How long had she been out? Surely not more than a couple of weeks, or perhaps months. Such a concept made her want to shudder. And the way the girl had talked about years. No, surely it couldn't have been a year. Could it? On the way back to her room, they ran into some other girls doing some cleaning. They were awfully young to be apprenticing, but they didn't seem to be future ladies of the estate so she didn't think they could possibly be anything else. Servants perhaps, but again, why so young? Kanzaki san called out to them and then pulled them into a quiet huddle. The three younger girls all glanced fearfully at Kayo and she couldn't help but feel a little uncomfortable. They must be shy. Then the three girls nodded their heads and ran off down the hallway. Um, definitely improper but Kayo hadn't exactly grown up in splendor like this. Perhaps the rumors of propriety and emphasis on being proper were exaggerated. My apologies, Suzuki-san, Kanzaki-san said with a slight bow to her patient before turning and continuing down the hallway. The head healer, Kacho Shinobu, will be here to explain everything to you shortly. I would appreciate it, Kayo said demurely. I will admit I have very little idea as to what is going on. Was it her or did the girl tense up for a moment there, almost to a point of pausing in her step? But if she did, she got over it quickly and simply continued on her way. She showed Kayo back into her room and the woman gratefully made her way back to the bed she'd been sleeping in. Even that short walk had exhausted her. I'll return with some broth for you, the young apprentice said with another bow before leaving and shutting the door. Hmm, this place was definitely strange, but if Kayo had been healed here, then she'd happily sing their praises to her village. And she planned on enjoying this luxury until she had to go home. But she did look forward to going back to her small house and her husband and children. For a moment, images flashed before her eyes of the houses around her as she literally tore through doors to get to the people hiding inside, of others running for their lives, of Ezum crying and pleading and bleeding. She shook her head. No, that had just been a nightmare. An extremely realistic nightmare but nothing more than a bad dream. Because things like that didn't happen in real life. She'd never truly believed that the old yaokai from the stories existed. She was a practical woman who took care of her house and her family. Strange happenings had explanations that didn't deal with Yaokai or Oni. That just seemed like an easy answer to her. And she would not change that stance now. <clears throat> By the time Kanzaki returned with her broth, Kayo had already fallen back asleep. XXX. Akatsugi looked out over the wall of the estate. The Yubayashiki estate that Muzan had been looking for. It consisted of old buildings and a wall that looked to be falling apart from the outside, something anyone looking for it could easily dismiss as abandoned. No wonder Nakaim hadn't really had any luck finding it, well, her or any of the previous demons, but it was only a matter of time, and the entire Yubayashiki family knew it. He actually found it a little inspiring, seeing how dedicated they all were to ending Muzan and his demons. He got a sense of surrealism when he remembered that he would have been one of those targeted although actually accomplishing destroying the demon king and his ilk would have been difficult for them, to say the least. However, as he glanced down and saw Rengoku and Haimjima sparring, he could honestly believe they could do it, working together as they tended to. Muzan hadn't ever wanted his demons to work together. Too much of a threat. His loss. Funny, he hadn't realized up until that point that getting his memories back had made him far more sentimental. He glanced down at the sparring pillars again and held back a sigh. He'd been training with both of them earlier today and it had been, well, if not fun, then enjoyable at least. Then they'd wanted to spar each other to see how they'd improved. Now he wanted them to hurry up and finish so he could go back to. Excuse me, if you would all follow me. A new voice spoke and he glanced down from where he sat on the warm roof tiles. One of the Yubayashiki children, one of the girls with white hair, stood in the doorway to the house. She even looked directly up at him. Even you, Akatsugi-san. The two Hashira stopped fighting and the very surprised demon simply nodded, jumping down from the roof and landing in front of her as he saw no reason to deny the request. She led them to the room he realized the Yubayashiki had liked to meet people in. Currently the two Hashira, one of their students Akatsugi hadn't actually met yet, and Akatsugi himself had remained there with the family. He'd basically slept and trained, slept some more, gotten to know the remaining Hashira and realized that he rather liked Rengoku. He could respect Haimjima, the man was likely the strongest pillar Akatsugi had ever met personally. But Rengoku was just fun, and he had so much fighting potential. Still, few people actually approached him and he found himself missing. Well, too many people, he supposed. He almost missed the other moons simply because he had known them and maybe Tanjiro. Kenroji had been a fun sparring partner. But most of all, he missed Koyuki and Sensei. These people tolerated him. Those people had cherished him even if he couldn't understand why they had cared for him so. Entering the room with the Yubayashiki head brought him back to the present. 
The other Hashira dropped to their knees. Akaza simply bowed at the waist. It was more respect than he'd shown everyone else willingly, but at least this man had given him a chance. Much like Tenjiro, and he deserved acknowledgement for that. I have received some news, Yubayashiki Sama said quietly. He wasn't smiling or facing them. That couldn't be good. Kamado Tenjiro and Shinazugawa Sanmi, our sun and wind pillars respectively, had an extremely unlucky run-in with another waxing moon. He took a breath and let it out. Waxing one, Akatsugi felt his blood run cold. No, that couldn't be. He'd know if Tenjiro had died, wouldn't he? But he also knew Kokushibo. The man was a storm in demon form. Did he kill them? The former waxing third asked, heedless of the glares the others shot him at his disrespect speaking out so abruptly. Capture them? Yubayashiki Sama shook his head. No, they lost but were able to get away. Well, Kamado was. So, Sanmi-san is gone, Haimjima said, tears beginning to run down his cheeks as he clutched his prayer beads. Yubayashiki Sama shook his head again. He was dying and, to save his life, Kamado-san made a very difficult decision. Akatsugi felt his jaw drop as he put it together. He turned him into a demon. The other men jumped, eyes wide and shocked. Rengoku seemed particularly vocal about how that couldn't have happened. But the demon didn't take his eyes off of Yubayashiki-sama. The ill man just sighed and nodded. More exclamations followed. Yubayashiki-sama held up a hand and waited for silence. According to their Kasugai crows and the report I just received from both Kamado-san and Shinobu-san, he has not been out of sight and has not eaten a bite of human flesh. Currently, he is sleeping in the demon cells at the butterfly estate. He looked in the direction of the largest Hashira. I would like to tell Shinazugawa-san's little brother personally. Haimjima didn't stop muttering prayers under his breath, but he did nod in acknowledgement. I will send Hinaki to escort him, Yubayashiki-sama continued. You are all dismissed. Thank you for coming. He shot them all a tired smile and they filed out the door, Akatsugi between the two pillars. He didn't know what to think of this. Kamado had already turned someone else into a demon, and he'd been a pillar before. Did that mean he would become stronger than Akatsugi? The only Kazuki who knew a breathing form was Kokushibo, second only to Muzan. Was he being replaced? He didn't know. Kamado wasn't like Muzan. And yet, a niggling worry squirmed in the back of his mind, small but painfully obvious. There were only three demons in this line and he was potentially the weakest of them. He couldn't let that happen. He wouldn't. Ahead of him, Haimjima turned to head towards his current rooms and Akatsugi paused. Akatsugi-san, Rengoku asked with a bright smile and those wide eyes. He turned to the man. Teach me a breathing form. The pillar looked taken aback. What? Akatsugi shook his head. I have to get stronger. I have to be able to compete with a demon who can use breathing forms. The man looked utterly confused. You are already plenty strong, Akatsugi-san. The demon shook his head. No, I'm not strong enough. I was only third under Dauma and Kokushibo and I wasn't catching up, no matter how hard I tried. Now with, I can only sleep to gain energy and stamina. It isn't enough, because he couldn't bear the idea of letting someone else overtake him again. The very thought of becoming obsolete terrified him. He couldn't be left behind again. Never again. Right then, he missed Koyuki so much it physically hurt. She hadn't meant to leave him, but she had. I don't think that is a good idea, Rengoku said with a huge smile on his face. Sometimes, Akatsugi couldn't help but be convinced that the flame Hashira didn't know or care how to read a mood. He could respect that, but he also found it extremely frustrating at times. Ask you by Ashiki Sama, then, he shot back, agitated, but realized that the flame pillar had no reason to acquiesce to his request. So he tried to think of a different angle, one that helped the core. It only took him a couple of seconds to come up with something. Besides, having stronger opponents to train with will help you become better and faster too. Okay, it wasn't the best. Akatsugi had never been a good strategist outside of actual battle. Fortunately, Rengoku bought it hook, line and sinker. You make an excellent point. I shall return to you by Ashiki-sama immediately. The demon felt himself relax a little. Yeah, thanks. He wasn't normally the type to give acknowledgement or gratitude. But this was definitely a special case. Meanwhile, I'll go sleep. Yes, you do that. I shall find you tomorrow. Akatsugi sighed and rubbed the back of his head tiredly as the flame Hashira hurried off. It occurred to him that he had been left alone in the Yubayashiki household. If he were still loyal to Muzan, this would be his chance to do some serious damage. Fortunately, he wanted nothing to do with that person ever again. With another sigh, he turned and began to walk back to his room. He would need all the strength he could get in the coming days. Notes and traditional Japanese undergarment. Many Japanese families didn't take surnames because they thought they would be taxed for them. 
In the late 1800s, during the Meiji era, a law was passed requiring every family to take a surname. Suzuki has been a common surname since that time according to the website I visited. So take that with a grain of salt. Also, I did try to do some research on this, but toilets of the Meiji era looked to be fairly communal and some of the pictures I saw were simply pits covered by a wooden platform with walls and a movable wooden plank. Simple but effective, I suppose. Once the idea of a toilet seat began to catch on with the middle and lower classes, they would often cover pits with toilets, much like an outhouse. Some areas and schools still use these to this day. Thanks to Time Lord Tim, found in Quathai's for beta reading. Love you guys. Jenya didn't understand. The situation had been explained to him twice and Yubai Ashiki-sama was starting on a third time. But the words just kind of washed over him without him grasping any of them after the news the first time. Your brother has become a demon. He remembered his mother, his sweet, loving mother who had done so much for them. And he remembered the monster she'd become. He remembered his siblings. All dead. 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 Never to walk or run or smile at him again. Their life had not been a happy one, per se, but he had loved his siblings so dearly. And now his brother. He thought back over the conversation, trying to wrap his head around it all. Before explaining anything, Yubai Ashiki-sama had prefaced the news with explaining the new demon line under a new progenitor, who hadn't even known he was a progenitor according to him. And this progenitor was a pillar even, working for the core, despite being a demon. Then they'd told him the demon's name, Kamado Tanjiro, the Sun Pillar. That guy he'd met at the final selection who couldn't be much older than him. He'd known about the Sun Pillar, and the rumors surrounding him, but he hadn't actually believed the guy had been a demon. He'd been a little shocked because he'd never imagined a demon working for the core. It had been difficult to consider, even knowing that he'd met the guy. He remembered wondering what Sainmi thought of that. He also remembered wondering how these new demons would react with his body, and if he could also eat them to gain their strength. Then the core head had explained that his brother had been caught in a demon fight with Waxing One. Jenya had felt like he'd been punched in the gut, or stabbed. It had suddenly been so difficult to breathe. Then they'd told him his brother had been fatally wounded and to save his life, the new pillar had turned him into a demon. Your brother has become a demon. His brother would have preferred to die. His brother would have protested at the very least, he was sure. His brother would hate his own existence if he had any of himself left. Losing Sami to death would have been bad. This, this was worse. Your brother has become a demon. The phrase kept repeating itself in his mind over and over and over again. He wasn't sure how long he sat there, sort of blankly staring ahead and not registering any of the presences around him. They'd all fallen away with that one sentence. Finally, he felt, as if from a distance, a heavy hand on his shoulder and he began the laborious process of pulling himself back to the present situation. His cheeks felt wet. He'd be embarrassed except he wasn't sure he could feel anything at the moment besides utter grief at losing the last of his family. He was vaguely aware that they had asked him something, but he wasn't sure what. I, I'm sorry, he managed to get out. What did you say? Yubai Ashiki-sama smiled sympathetically at him. I have arranged for you to go and see him, if you would like. Tacho-san has a theory that surrounding him with people who remind him of his past will help him remember. If he remembers, he'll hate himself, Jenya said numbly as he rose to his feet. They're rather sure he's going to remember whether you're there or not. You could simply help him remember faster, Yubai Ashiki-sama said, not unkindly. Jenya could just see in his mind's eye how well that would go over. Why haven't you killed him? He asked, uncaring of how rude he was being, standing before the head of the core and speaking in such a tone. He hasn't tasted human flesh, Yubai Ashiki-sama said. He's shown remarkable restraint, actually. Jenya just shook his head. It would be a mercy, he insisted. The head of the core frowned. I cannot condemn someone for something they haven't done. He's a demon. The younger Shinazugawa returned, voice heated. He only backed down when he felt Haimjima's hand on his shoulder again. He is not Musen's demon, Yubai Ashiki-sama said, voice soft. I don't see a difference, Jenya shot back. Silence fell over the room. I believe it would be in your best interest to see him, the core head said thoughtfully and not unkindly. Therefore I am ordering you to the butterfly estate. Understood, Jiomai san Jenya felt his mouth drop open. He couldn't see his brother. He couldn't, and yet, his mentor was bowing and affirming him. And he couldn't seem to open his mouth to stop them. For some reason, he could only stand there until Haimjima-san put a hand on his shoulder and led him to the door. He was going to see Sanmi. Sanmi who had warned him to not join the core. Sanmi who had been turned into a demon. The image of his mother with that crazed, hungry look in her eye flashed in front of him again. It was hard to breathe. Everything faded out again. 
When he regained himself, he was in his room with his mentor as Haimjima-san led him through the stone breathing exercises. Exercises he couldn't use, but they did help calm him down. I, I can't go, he finally managed to choke out. I can't see him like that. Like what? Haimjima-san asked gently, face stoic but blank eyes kind. Like a demon. Like a monster. How? How could you by Ashiki-sama be willing to even entertain working with a demon? If we get rid of Muzan and his demons, we'll still have these to contend with. They can't be that different. A demon is a demon. He was breathing heavily once he finished and he had to force himself to calm down. Panicking again would not help right now. You sound like your brother, Haimjima-san said softly. Jenya couldn't take it anymore and he let out a loud cry of anger and anguish, screaming all of his rage and pain and loss out before he collapsed in on himself and sobbed. Then he felt large, warm arms encircle him, and even when he struggled, the man wouldn't let him go. Eventually he just gave in to the offered comfort and cried into the man's chest. I must admit, I am skeptical of the circumstances of all of this, and I wish to go and evaluate the situation for myself. That caused Jenya to pause and look up. Hyo, what? Haimjima-san shook his head. The circumstances are too coincidental, and perhaps it is innocent. But I cannot be sure unless I go and find out for myself. And suddenly Jenya felt as if a weight had been lifted off of his shoulders. He wasn't the only one who saw a problem with this and it just felt so. Freeing. What? What if it wasn't a coincidence? He asked. What if they're lying or? Or something? The larger man let out a sigh. Then we will have to take care of it ourselves. Then he turned as if he could look down at Jenya. Can you kill your brother if it comes down to it? For a moment, the younger boy could only blink up at the man in front of him. Because what had he just asked? But then, he felt his resolve steal and he nodded before remembering he'd have to speak his affirmation aloud. Yes, he said. I'll do whatever I have to to avenge him, even if that means killing him myself, or his progenitor. Haimjima smiled sadly. You are a good younger brother, Jenya. He returned the smile, albeit shakily. Thanks, Sensei. Get some sleep. We leave as soon as Obanai-san returns to the estate either tonight or tomorrow. Jenya nodded firmly. Yes, he said firmly. He also planned on cleaning all of his gear, making sure it was in top working condition, swords, guns, whatever he could. He'd have to be ready to face his brother after all. His eyes flashed, and this Kamado Tenjiro, XXX. When Kaya woke next, she felt far better, more rested, more relaxed, still sore but in a different way than before and she couldn't quite place why. This time, a woman, no a girl, she couldn't be more than 18 years sat nearby, clothed in the same black suit that Kanzaki had worn with a Hayori over the top. It looked like butterfly scales, actually. Quite pretty, very rich. Why did that seem so intimidating? The girl looked up from the papers she'd been examining when Kaio moved. Then she smiled. Ah, Suzuki-san, I'm glad to see you're awake. I'll have some broth brought right to you. Thank you, Kaio said as she pushed herself to sit up. Her body still didn't seem to want to respond well, but at least it was better than before. I appreciate your hospitality. Of course, then her stomach let out a particularly loud growl. Both women froze. Oh, I'm so sorry. Please excuse me, Kayo said hurriedly. That went beyond embarrassing and straight into mortifying territory. How horrible of a guest would they think she was now? It's no worry, the woman said, smile still on her face as she practically flitted to the doorway and opened it. Do you have any food preferences? Anything you're craving right now? She still felt her ears burning with embarrassment but gave the question serious thought. Eventually, she figured that going simple would likely be the best. Rice and fish is fine. I don't need more than that, she said, looking down. Hum, the woman responded with a strange look on her face. Very well. Hey oi. She called down the hallway. That startled Kayo. She wasn't used to such loud noises. Wasn't that supposed to be discouraged in such estates? Yes, she heard the Kanzaki girl say. Our guest is awake again and quite hungry. She said she'd like fish and rice along with the broth. A rather long silence followed before she heard the girl acknowledge in the affirmative and head off down the hall. The woman turned back to Kayo and walked daintily to the stool she'd been sitting on after closing the door. Well, Suzuki-san, I suppose that we should begin to get everything cleared up. Kayo couldn't help but feel grateful that the woman seemed ready to finally explain everything. Firstly, my name is Kacho Shinobu and this is my estate. Kayo's eyes widened. Your estate. Kacho looked amused at that. You expected someone else. Of course not, the older woman assured. It's just, aren't you a little young? Ah, uh, yes. Well, you see, my family was killed when I was young and then I inherited this from my sister when I decided to continue her work. What a sad story. Kayo's heart went out to the girl. 
my sincerest sympathies for your loss. The smile turned bittersweet, but seemed more genuine somehow. I appreciate that, but I'm here to talk about you. So, can you tell me where you are from? Kayo blinked. You don't know. Kacho shook her head. The older woman frowned. But didn't my husband bring me here to be healed? Again, the younger woman shook her head. No, he didn't. Worry rose in Kayo's stomach. So you were sick? Kacho asked, checking over some notes she'd written on sheets of paper. That had to be the nicest looking paper Kayo had ever seen. Too bad she felt too worried to admire such quality. I was, she said, deciding she needed to explain everything from the beginning. I recently came down with something. We weren't sure what, but I had pains in my side and stomach that continued to grow. It got to a point where I could not breathe well at all and had difficulty eating. When I woke up here, all the pain had vanished and I assumed I had you and your clinic to thank for it. The woman's smile had diminished and now she just sat there looking sadly at Kayo. Did you have any family? The older woman nodded. I do. Not did. My husband, Ezum, and my daughters, Itsuko and Chio. When I got sick, Ezum sent them away to live with his sister so they wouldn't contract it. I must get a hold of them immediately. They'll be so worried. The woman didn't comment on that. Instead she just sighed and looked down at her papers again. If you tell me the town you're from, we'll see what we can do. Relief welled in Kayo's chest and she looked gratefully at the girl. Thank you. The woman shot her another unintelligible look before she raised an eyebrow. Kayo realized she hadn't given the name of her town, so she did. And she spoke her sister-in-law's name and the city she lived in as well as her husband's name, and then gave her her husband's parents' names and villages as well as her own. Just as she finished up that last one, Kanzaki came into the room carrying a tray with three bowls on it. One was covered with cloth, obviously the broth, while the others held cooked fish and rice, respectively. It looked delicious. Carefully, the girl sat the tray on the small table by Kayo's bedside. Please be careful as you sit up, she said as she moved the tray so it would be easier to eat from. Thank you, Kanzaki-san. The patient said as she forced her feet to move and, after far too much finagling, managed to get into position. Then she smiled and clapped her hands. Ikadakamasu, she said softly then went to pick up her chopsticks. Oh, please have the broth first, Kacho-san spoke up. We need to make sure your stomach can handle that before you have more. Kayo didn't quite know what to make of that, but she figured that she was the guest and thus did as asked. She drank quietly from the bowl of broth, enjoying the rich, meaty taste. She'd never had broth like this before, and was happy that it didn't sit too heavy on her stomach. How do you feel? Kacho-san asked once Kayo had finished the broth. She honestly thought about it and then smiled softly. I feel well. It is not a broth I have had before. I quite enjoyed it. Thank you, Kanzaki said in her stern, quiet voice. So, she'd made it then. What an impressive girl. How about you try a little of the rice, then? Kacho-san ventured. Kayo wasn't sure she liked the interested look on the younger woman's face, but she picked up the chopsticks and went for the rice anyway. She ate small bites of the sticky, white grains and paid attention to her stomach. She didn't expect to be able to finish the bowl, but before she knew it, she had. She noted the other two still watching her intently, but tried to ignore them as she brought the fish around. Normally, she would have the fish with the rice, but separate was fine with her too. To her surprise, she finished the fish completely as well and felt very satisfied for the first time in. Well, it felt like the first time in a very long time although she'd usually had enough to eat before from what she could recall. It was a very good meal, and I thank you, she said politely, bowing a little from her position. Kanzaki, who had stayed in the room the entire time, just nodded her head, picked up the tray and left. Shinobu-san clapped her hands together once and closed her eyes as she smiled. I am glad you enjoyed the food and that it didn't make you sick. Kaya wondered why she seemed so worried about that, but decided not to ask. It would be an embarrassing and very rude question. Before we continue, Kacho-san said, could you please tell me what year it is? The question, so similar to Kanzaki's earlier, shot some anxiety through her chest. Something was very off here. It Meiji, she said, more of a question than an answer. I really hope it isn't nine Meiji. Instead of answering her implied question, Kacho-san asked another of her own. Since we don't know how long you were out, could you tell me anything you remember of your recent life? Anything that could lead to clues as to why we found you in the middle of the wilderness? Kayo couldn't help but be taken aback. I was found in the wilderness. Kacho-san nodded. Near a pond, actually. That almost stopped Kayo's heart. A pond? No, surely it couldn't be. Does this have any significance? The younger woman continued. Kayo felt her breath quicken and bit the inside of her lip before deciding to answer. I remember very little. I don't remember leaving my home at all. 
my husband had gone for a new doctor. I think he came back with a man, but after that it gets fuzzy and I only had bad dreams. Dreams, Kacho san pushed. The older woman looked away. I'd prefer not to discuss it. The other girl smiled softly, I understand. However, it may be important to your treatment and recovery. Therefore, I must insist. I promise, I will not judge. That didn't make her feel much better, but the woman had a good point. So she sighed. I had dreams of turning into a monster, killing people, killing my own husband. She cut off with a choke and had to take several breaths before continuing on. Then I wandered for several years doing the same. All that drove me was hunger and all I could eat were humans. She shuddered. It was a horrible nightmare. It was, Kacho-san whispered in agreement, but she looked so melancholy. Kacho-san, Kayo asked. The woman looked entirely too sad when she spoke next. I should probably explain something else to you. My name is Kacho Shinobu, and I am a doctor and head of this estate, the Butterfly Estate. I am also known as the Insect Pillar, one of the highest ranks, for a group known as the Demon Slayers. She shook her head. The Meiji era lasted for 49 years and it is now the Taisho era. It has been for a while. We found you near a pond after you attacked some children playing nearby. I'm sorry, Suzuki-san, but what you remember was no dream. XXX. Hello, Akatsugi-san. Rengoku rushed over to him, grinning widely, even more widely than normal. Akatsugi, who had just gotten up from a 20-hour sleep, blinked at him. Hello, Rengoku-san he replied a touch groggily, still waking up a bit. He'd actually gone looking for a sparring partner, so this was fortuitous. The man's smile widened. You may call me Kaiojiro if you wish. Now, I spoke with you by Eshiki-sama about teaching you a breath style. That certainly woke Akatsugi up fully. What did he say? You would like to speak with you about it. I am to escort you there. Come, follow me. And without waiting for so much as a reaction, he turned on his heels and marched down the corridor. The demon blinked as he watched the other man walk away, but then shook his head and hurried after him. They met Yubai Ashiki-sama in the same room they'd met before, Rengoku. Er, Kaiojiro standing with his arms folded off to one side instead of taking a seat. Please, be seated, Akatsugi-san. The sickly man said once they'd entered, gesturing to the table and the cushion across from him. The demon glanced at the flame pillar before he ended up sitting down as invited. He didn't see a reason not to. Now, Rengoku-san. I know my father preferred Rengoku, but due to recent developments I have decided I do not. You may call me Kaiojiro, Oyakata-sama. The interrupted man smiled in the flame pillar's direction and nodded, then turned back to the resident demon. Kaiojiro-san says you would like to learn a breath style. What has brought this on, if I may ask? Akatsugi raised his chin a little, even knowing the other man couldn't see it. I've been stuck, he finally decided to go with. I have been for a long while, actually. Not untrue, but kind of difficult to admit. Still, it was also necessary. I want to make up for the lives I have taken and I'd like to help you take Musen down. I know I used to be the third strongest waxing moon, but I don't know if you understand how strong he is. You understand that Kamado can beat me. And yikes, that hurt to say too, but he went on. You also understand that he couldn't beat Kokushibo. Use him. I've seen him overpower Kokushibo once. It was hardly a thought and then it just happened. No struggle, no contest. He's just that far above us power-wise. The simple answer is, I'm just not strong enough if I truly want to accomplish any goals. If I truly want to help you accomplish your goals. Hmm, Yubai Ashiki sama replied thoughtfully. And beating waxing one and two have nothing to do with it. Akatsugi frowned. Of course it has something to do with it. I couldn't get strong enough as one of Musen's demons to take them on and to get to him they'll need to be taken down too. What an odd thing to say. The core head nodded again, still thoughtful and with that kind smile on his face. Why ask Kaiojiro-san? Why not ask Tenjiro-san to teach you? Akatsugi opened his mouth, then closed it. Then he finally replied. It didn't occur to me to ask him when he was here. He answered truthfully, if a little sullenly. Kamada would probably ask you for permission anyway, so I may as well just come to you, too. Hmm. Yubai Ashiki-sama nodded a little, then he sat forward. Akatsugi-san, you are asking that I give you, a demon who is already extremely strong, a great deal more potential power. Many of the pillars still speak against you and Tanjiro-san and this would make them uncomfortable to say the least. I have to admit, I don't believe their fears are completely unfounded. That was understandable. Akatsugi couldn't help but feel a little disappointed, but... He couldn't really blame the Hashira either. He still searched his mind for something else to try and convince the man, though. Going against a demon with breathing can be good for training. He pointed out, knowing he was grasping at straws. Kaiojiro had liked that line. He didn't think Yubai Ashiki-sama would. 
we do already have two demons who know how to use breathing styles. Yeah, Kamado and his new demon, Akatsugi replied, perhaps a little bitterly. Ah, but Oyakata-sama, will we be able to train with them? Is Kamado-san not going home soon? Kaiojiro put in. Akatsugi couldn't help but be taken a little aback. He hadn't expected the man to stand up for him. He wasn't sure how he felt about it, but he wouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth. He nodded to the flame pillar before turning to look at Oyakata-sama again. For a blind man, he had an extremely intense expression on his face. Are you, perhaps, worried that you cannot be useful now that Tenjiro-sen has another demon under his care? Akatsugi couldn't help but freeze for a moment, but then he shook his head angrily. No. And yet, the man's face softened even more. You know Tenjiro-san isn't like that, do you not, Akatsugi-san? The demon didn't answer. He couldn't. If he did, he'd yell or scream and undo any good he'd ever done here. All the good any demon had ever done here. Aye. He tried after a moment, but then shook his head. He'd have to play his last card. Please, Oyakata-sama. He bowed low to the table, hating how he had to do this. But becoming obsolete would be worse. I will not let you down. After several seconds of silence, Oyakata-sama spoke. Raise your head, Akatsugi-sam. Your humility shows me your dedication. I will deliberate on this, and I promise you I will take your request seriously. If I cannot acquiesce, I will explain why in detail and try to find a compromise. It was honestly more than he'd expected, as it had been delivered by the man's kind, soothing voice. He could believe the core head would honestly deliver it and give his sign a fair chance. So different from Musen, it was odd how often it struck him. Thank you, Oyakata-sama, he said as he stood. Come, let us go and train. Kaiojiro said, still grinning as he gestured for Akatsugi to go ahead of him out the door. Yeah, Akatsugi replied. He could use a good fight right about now. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss a video. And comment down your opinion on this video. Thanks for stopping by and I'll see you in the next one.